have Old Woodward Avenue Project Awards. So Mr. Mr. O'Meara will be, uh, as you may recall, last year we had uh, a project going on, and that was the Old Woodward Project. We reconstructed uh, not only the above ground uh, section of Old Woodward from Brown to Oakland, but we've also did the underground from Brown to uh, Oakland on Old Woodward. As a result of that, uh, Mr. O'Meara has some uh, items he'd like to share with us this evening and some accolades that the city received for that project. So with that, Mr. O'Meara, I'll turn it over to you. All right, I'll just take a minute of your time. Uh, as you know, um, Old Woodward was a landmark project for Birmingham, but it also was a pretty significant project for the whole southeast Michigan area because there was so much going on and um, really transformed the area well. And um, I did bring along our two lead engineers here with us today, Brett Buholtz and um, Paul Tillich Angus, that um, are from Noack and Frouse. There was obviously a lot of people behind the scenes on the design team, but they were the two key figures that I thought I should acknowledge. But um, we did get several awards that I thought you should just be aware of. Um, I Frady, our contractor, applied for this one because they felt that it was a, a very um, exceptional concrete job that the way it turned out for them, they did use some um, new innovative techniques that worked out really well. So the Michigan Concrete Paving Association gave us an award. And then um, the American Council of Engineering Companies of Michigan gave us award, um, a merit award. And um, that's all the uh, consulting engineering firms get together and, and also select what they feel are the, the most major projects for the year. Am I going too fast? <laughs> and then um, lots of times we always work with the American Public Works Association, of course, which is more our bailiwick. So um, many times we've gotten these regional Project of the Year awards from the, the local chapter, but this time they also applied to the um, state level, and um, we actually won a state award too. So this is the first time this has happened in quite a while. So this is the Quality of Life Award for those projects between five and twenty-five million dollars. Wow, I would say. That's four awards for a project that has transformed our downtown. It's a pleasure to walk the streets because the sidewalks are widened and there's very pretty uh, beds, trees, and it's made it wonderful. And as a driver, smooth road, easy to get around downtown. So wonderful work and congratulations to everyone in the city and our contractors, of course, for a fantastic outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, so it's my turn again. <laughs> a reminder that the citywide master plan drop-in clinic will be open tomorrow, July 9th, and Wednesday, July 10th, from 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. It is being held at 255 South Old Woodward in downtown Birmingham. You are invited to stop by and learn more about the process as well as lend your voice to planning the city's next 20 years. So our um, team that has been working on the master plan has a lot of information <coughs> up on the walls in uh, the building 255. So how to describe where that is? What, what's next to it? Well, it's just south of the Birmingham Theater on that side of the street. It's the easiest way to know where 255 is. And I encourage everyone in this room that hasn't gone by there and at home that's listening to uh, take a few minutes to go in and see what our master planners have in mind. And you can possibly still affect the outcome of that master plan. Next, the 2019 In the Park Summer Concert Series in Shane Park continues on Wednesday, July 10th from noon to 2 p.m. with Siloam Pool playing soul and smooth jazz, followed at 7 p.m. with Steve Ako playing pop and rock. And on Wednesday, July 17th, Audrey Ray Country Music at 7 p.m., all in Shane Park. An information session on the Birmingham North Old Woodward Project 
is planned for July 16th at 6.30 p.m. at the Birmingham Bloomfield Art Center. That's located at 1516 South Cranbrook Road in Birmingham. All are invited to attend. Now we're moving on to appointments. We have interviews for the Birmingham Museum Board. Judith Kiefer is uh, currently on the board and her term expires, so she's up for reappointment. I understand that she's unavailable unless she showed up. She didn't. She had another commitment. Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Hoff. Well, I was planning to talk to her a little bit about um, if this works into her schedule. She may have a work schedule that's preventing her from attending the meetings because she has um, missed most of the meetings this year. So my only concern is her personal schedule. So I was hopeful that she was going to be here. And if she isn't, I would suggest we postpone the appointment. Okay. Are we uh, under the same impression okay we will postpone that appointment moving on interviews for the Greenwood Cemetery Advisory Board there are, are two uh, terms that are expiring and two people on the board currently want to be reappointed and the first is Margaret Souter Good evening. Could you tell us why you want to be reappointed? Yes. Of well, course, you should introduce yourself first. Yes. My name is Margaret Souter. I live at 1795 Yosemite. I have lived in Birmingham almost all of my life, with a short little, when I was a child. But um, I love Birmingham. I grew up here, and I just love it. And I think that it's a wonderful little town, and I want to be a part of doing something to keep the uh, ambiance and the feel of the town. Um, that nice little town that we are. Yeah. So um, I would like to be reappointed because um, I've, I've been on one term. It was a three-year term. There's a lot that we have to do yet. Um, we, we made some headway, but um, not nearly as much as I thought. I mistakenly thought that government moved much faster than it does, and I've been told that it doesn't. So <laughs> my apologies to all of you for explaining great expectations, but I think that another term on the uh, on the board would be beneficial, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone. All right. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Our other applicant is Linda Buchanan. If you could introduce yourself and also tell us why you want to be reappointed. Okay, uh, good evening. My name is Linda Buchanan and I live at 1280 Suffield. I may be a neighbor to somebody. <laughs> Lord. Um, I think I wrote most of the reasons that I, um, on my application, about why I want to be back and have another tenure on the board. But uh, let me just say, it, basically, I consider myself an advocate for the preservation of the cemetery, and I'd like another term to continue that work. Thank you. Any questions for Linda? Thank you. Okay. It is our practice to ask for nominations uh, in the order that people were interviewed. So uh, that would be Margaret Souter first, Mayor Pro Tem Boutros. I'd like to nominate Ms. Souter. Okay. And uh, any other nominations? Or that's not how we do it. Do I? No. 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 <laughs> no. Take it in I can do The nominations I do. Nominate. The voting is by uh, order of nomination. All right. Commissioner Harris. I'd like to nominate Ms. Linda Buchanan to the other advisory board position. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of Margaret Souter? Aye. 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 All those in favor of Linda Buchanan? Aye. Aye. Thank you both. <clears throat> uh, I think we can have you um, yes, be sworn in. And since there are only two people, we'll observe this practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, 
do you swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of this state and endeavor to secure and maintain an honest and efficient administration of the affairs of Birmingham, free from partisan distinction or control, and to perform the duties of the Office of Greenwood Cemetery Advisory Board according to the best of your ability? I do. Thank you. I just need you to sign. <laughs> Congratulations to both of you. We appreciate your service on the cemetery board. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to move on to our consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion and approved by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of the items unless a commissioner or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and either considered right away or under the last item of new business. Are there any items a commissioner wishes to remove? Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Boutros. Mayor, I'd like to recuse myself from item A as I was absent for the uh, joint city commission and planning board meeting. All right. On, ju on June 17. Commissioner DeWeese. I need to recuse myself from item B because I was absent. Okay. Any commissioner have? Commissioner Harris. I too must uh, recuse myself from item 4C because I was absent on June 24th. All right. Thank you. Does any commissioner have an item to pull? Commissioner Hoff, I'm sure you were here for all of those meetings. <laughs> I was here. <laughs> I was here. I would like to pull J and M. All right. And I am going to pull uh, item. Hang on a second. I'm sorry, but I scribbled. <coughs> and I want to be sure. Yes. Item B. Commissioner Hoff, would you like to go ahead? I can wait. We need a we have motion. To have motion. Oh, we need a motion. This is a very interesting evening I'm having, and I'm sure you'll all be patient while I gather my head. Commissioner Hoff. Well, I'll move the consent agenda with the uh, recusals and uh, without items B, J, and M. And uh, noting the recusals. I, I said that. Okay. I second that. Okay. All those in favor? No, 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 roll, roll call, call vote. And, it says and, that and, right and here. Buffett. And <laughs> you never ask about the public. Before. You're right. Is there anyone from the public that would like to remove a consent agenda item? Seeing none. Will you take a roll call vote, you please? Betcha. Mayor Boardman? Aye. Mayor Pro Tim Boutros? Aye. Commissioner DeWeese? Aye. Commissioner Harris? Aye. Commissioner Hall? Aye. Commissioner Nikita? Aye. Commissioner Sherman? Aye. Commissioner Hoff? Thank you. I'd like to uh, move forward on these now. Uh, the first one that I um, <coughs> asked to pull was uh, for Jay, and this is about the Oakland County um, Pilot Local Road Improvement Program. And Mr. O'Meara, my question on this is, um, I see that the program provides a 50% matching grant. And um, I think that's wonderful that we're going to get that. I see that we have uh, saved up our matching grants from previous years, and that now we have a total of $125,291. Uh, we're eligible for. But my question is, if it's a 50% matching grant and it's a $728,000 project, why is it only $125,000? Well, the project is sized on based on what we feel we need for that street. Um, that, but that's what the county is offering is the 125. It has really, their numbers are based on their finances. So it, it's 50% a part of it. Right. Certain. We're certainly welcome to spend more than 50 percent, which yeah, we're doing. Certain <laughs> certain aspects, they are uh, reimbursing us for 50 percent, but we're we're going to okay. And then I see it's listed as um, Bowers and Elm. 
I know Bowers is going to be done, water, sewer, and the street. What about Elm? Elm is the same type of project. We're replacing the water main and then putting an asphalt resurfacing on top. All the way um, from Bowers to Maple? No, it's just the one block south of Bowers, so it's just um, the short section from Bowers to Woodward, actually. Oh, the, just the portion south of Bowers? Yes. Okay. Based on that, if there are no other comments, I will move the suggested resolution. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And now M? I pulled for M, and this is the Parking Management Services Operator Contract Renewal. As I read this, I mean, I'm, I'm um, quite familiar with SP+, uh, and I know they've been working for us since 1954. Um, and when I had contact with them, I believe they were called Central Parking. But anyway, um, my question is, there are so many different figures in here that I got a little confused as I read it all, and I don't really understand what we're approving, wh why this amount, when elsewhere in the, it, it claims that we, that the uh, total bid is 1,681,430, so why tonight are we being asked to approve, um, Whatever it is, a th the management uh, fee of three thousand eight hundred seventy-five, forty-six thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah. So the reason for the difference in the amounts is that our operating costs, our operating expenses, are approved through the budget process because those are our costs, regardless of who the manager is of the parking infrastructure and the system that we have today. What we're approving with SB Plus is a management fee to, to, to manage and oversight the staff, the financials, um, and the permit process. And if for whatever reason, since 1954, they would somehow end up changing hands in the future um, with the, for, for whatever reason, uh, we would potentially change the management team, but the staffing in place does not have to change. The operating expenses that we have for the garages does not change as a result. So that amount of that, I believe it was 1.6 million, I'm not looking at it, I apologize, um, was for our operating expenses that get approved through the budget, budget process, not for their management fee. And that's the only part of the contract that we're actually approving with them. The reason why we ask for them to provide that number for operating expenses as part of the bid is because we're not sure with different firms how they would manage the system. So we tell them what our system contains so they know they have to operate five garages and some surface lots and they may come back and tell us that they need fewer staff to do so, they may tell us that they need more staff to do so. So we try to gauge what they would end up charging to the system to operate it with the amount of inventory that we have. But if they've been um our provider on uh, overseeing our parking for so many years, they must, they when know. we allocate this money, 1.6 million, doesn't include the management. It's not only the, the uh, employees, it's the management too. Well, it's the management fee. So we're trying, we have to sort of separate the fees from the operating costs. That management fee is what we compared one team against the other. Um, when we looked at the evaluation of the proposals. Uh, we saw, I believe, with LAS parking, they came in at 42000 a year. With SB Plus, they came in at 46000 And because of the fact that SB Plus has a key performance indicator approach to this so that they only get half of their operating fee unless we're certain that they meet all of the expectations that the city has set forth in the contract, then they get 100% of that fee. That's why we chose to go with them because they have the best value and the best mechanisms for control. Um, but they also had to provide to us exactly how they were going to manage our inventory. If they had come back and said that they were going to charge us $3 million in operating expenses or there was going to be $3 million worth of operating expenses based on our current inventory, that would have been a question, a questionable item for us to go back and ask them why they would expect the fees to double. And have since have we, we paid this fee previously? We, every year we have to pay this fee. This is the fee to operate our garages. Oh, so we always do? Oh, we always do. The only reason we ask the question is to understand how much they would say they need in order to provide the services per the scope of work. And we just wanted to know if that number would change, quite honestly, is what we were looking for. Is this the same as it's been? Yes, it's consistent. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, it's the same amount. Yes. You just put <laughs> it out. Same. You just put it out for bid. That's all. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. then, what is this? Um, uh, the purchase of a dedicated power washer with the necessary trailer and pickup truck totaling sixty-six thousand. 
So what SP Plus did as a unique characteristic of their bid was they offered to buy certain items in the garage, for the garages to upkeep them that would make them more efficient in, deliver, in their delivery model. And so they contrib contributed to, as part of sort of a partnership approach, they contributed to the garages so that they could make their staff more efficient. So they're planning to make that purchase of 66000 on behalf of the city. It's not an additional cost for us. It's something they're contributing. And what about the new readers? The Park Connect? Uh, uh, yeah. The Park Connect, they're actually looking to try to, we have the issue of queuing at the garages that I think we're all familiar with where cars just sort of load up on the street because people don't know how to use their car credit cards appropriately or sometimes the machines aren't operating as we would hope they would. So the Park Connect readers allow people to have an online um, reader. I'm not all that techie, so forgive this bad explanation. Um, but it allows for an online reader that can be paired up with the SCADATA machine. It's a, an attachment to the SCADATA machine. So when you drive up, you can just sort of wave your phone there, and it knows it's you. It'll charge your, charge your account, and then you can come right in, so it'll reduce queuing time. They're offering to purchase that system and pay for the subscription fee for a year so that we can understand if it's going to be beneficial and reduce the amount of queuing time in the garages. So all of our readers can be adapted with that new equipment? They're not the same as the Skadata equipment. They get added on to it. So yes, we can use the base of the foundation that is the Skadata machine and add on to it so that that sort of reader can identify a vehicle pulling up that it has that same okay. uh, technology. Okay. All right. I will uh, move the suggested... Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one minute. I am quite excited to hear about uh, some of these additions that SP Plus has uh, decided to offer. I I'm a little confused about one thing you said, though. Sure. I believe you said that they, SP Plus is offering to pay for the first year <laughs> of the um, Park Connect. That is correct. Is it one year only, guys? That is in the bid. Yes, it is for one. But in our suggested resolution, we're uh, agreeing to pay a one-year monthly subscription. Oh, okay. So those are two different items. This this proposal does have a lot of different pieces to it, so I do understand the questions for this mm -hmm. evening. The Park Connect is separate from the proposal. They are covering that cost 100%. What's included in the resolution for this evening is the cost for the mobile parking application that they are putting okay. together in the subscription fee for that for one year. All right, which we've been, that's Park Mobile? No, no, that no. Is a, that's a customized app that was going to show our on-street and off-street parking in real time availability. So, so. the app they're paying for, but what is this? So then? Park Connect, let me separate the two more clearly. Park Connect is so that when you enter into the garage, your right. phone recognizes you and yes. then you can come on it. It doesn't tell you anything about parking availability. It's just simply a way right. in which to pay. The parking mobile app is actually something that you look at on your phone before or while you're in town right. looking for available parking. So what are they paying for? They are paying for Park Connect only. Right, that's what yes. I thought. But this $1,500 is for what? for the mobile app subscription for one year. But that's not Park Mobile? What's it the is. mobile app? So That, that sounds like a third thing. This is another thing. It is, absolutely. So we've been talking about, and actually you may remember when we had our budget hearing, we talked about development of an app that would show a user that was coming into the downtown where available parking was, either in the garages or on street. Okay. And so SP Plus is working with us to develop that app. That does not exist today. Only thing that we have now is how many spaces are in the garage. But there's nothing else that you can see about the parking system as you are entering into the downtown. Okay. So. This $1,500 is for this new app. Correct. But it is not in service yet. Correct. So... When do we start paying the one-year monthly subscription? When the app is available to users. And that is expected. The timeline that we have set forth right now is 10 to 12 weeks, so in October of this year. Okay. So I'm a little concerned about the wording of this resolution because it appears that we would start paying this when we approve this. So whoever uh, moves to this suggested resolution, I would like to have it include 
language that we don't start paying until the app is up and running. Commissioner Hoff? I'm not clear on why this these both are in the same resolution because it seems like they're two different things unless SP Plus is uh, has something to do with the app, but I... They're creating it. Part of their proposal. Oh, they're yes. developing this app? Yes. yes. Oh, oh. Yes. Okay. And will we still have the um, oh, lit up uh, signs at every structure with the number of spaces? Yes. Those that's something available. altogether different. Right. That's just another layer of information available to users in the downtown. Okay. All right. Is there a motion? Yes. I'll move the suggested resolution. I would like to have the language that we are not going to be paying this until the app is up and running. Yes, well, that should be included. I can't see exactly where, but. Does it look stated? Would you like for me to offer a suggestion? Please. Okay, just after the amount not to exceed $18,000, um, we could say after successful execution, parenthetically perhaps. All right. Is that acceptable? No. No. Uh, the cost for mobile application development and maintenance for a one-year monthly subscription of fifteen hundred dollars in an amount not to exceed eighteen in an in, for a one-year monthly subscription of fifteen hundred dollars, beginning when when beginning when upon execution. We don't know. Oh, beginning on execution. Put put it in there in an amount not to exceed eighteen thousand dollars. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. That. Thank you, Commissioner Deweese. All right. Any comments from the commission on the motion? Any comments from the public? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, Tiffany. All right, we have no unfinished business, so we're... You, you, you had one you called, A. Oh, I, I did. B. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of small uh, changes on page 9. I noticed that um, in the second full paragraph, um, the general liability was not 300000 it was $3 million. Yeah. And back on page seven. Oh. All right. That'll be all, unless there's any other comments on the minutes of uh, June 20th. Could someone move? I'll Commissioner move Sherman. I'll move item B. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> All right. So, no unfinished business. New business, which is item six. We have a public hearing of necessity regarding the Cape Seal program. I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, good evening, Mayor Boardman, City Commissioners. As you know, the Department of Public Services staff regularly reviews the city's unimproved streets and, if necessary, approves a Cape Seal maintenance project. Um, when we look at those, we consider, to start, the surface age, but it's also we look for common defects such as alligator cracking, road center crowning, um, and just general surface loss. Having evaluated those, we've propose a project for Cape Seal involving the following streets. Norfolk, North Lawn from Cranbrook to Latham, Worth, the blocks of Maple to Ridgedale and Madison to Kennesaw, Wimbledon, Pleasant Court, Lakeside from Lake, uh, I'm sorry, Lakeside from Oak to Corton, Croft and Sheffield from Woodward to South Eaton. I should note Lakeview was included uh, in the first round of uh, notifications that we sent about this public hearing, but subsequent to those notifications, residents on Lakeview were successful in obtaining uh, the required signatures for an upgrade petition for a fully improved road. So based, uh, given those circumstances, we recommend, we've, we've pulled it from uh, this recommended project. 
and I'm available for any questions you or the public may have. Uh, Commissioner DeWeese. When, when will Lakeview from Oak to Harmon come before us? But that's the more complicated process. We're going to um, we're in the process right now of notifying the neighbors what's happening, and then we'll have a neighborhood meeting. And if we verify that there is still a majority of people interested, that'll come before you probably, I would guess, within two months. And if they change their mind, then you would come back for Cape Seal, or or it just passes. Um, well, we'd have to review that with the manager and um, EPS to see if it's too late at that point. Okay. And we'd have to come back before you as well. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Hoff. Uh, another question about Lakeview. That is the whole sec, all of Lakeview, isn't it? Right. Okay. Because a um, few years ago, I don't remember if it was Lakeview or Lakeside or which street uh, a portion of the residents wanted it. Do you remember, Paul, which one? Yes. Was it Lakeview? Yes. Oh, but now it's the whole street. Right. Okay. Um, my other question is on a couple of these, like... Um, um, North Lawn and Worth, there's another section of those streets that is not being cave sealed. Is it because it's been done at another time, or why is it that the whole street isn't being done? Uh, it's because these sections that I indicated here are kind of uh, one-offs in the middle of what are otherwise improved blocks. Oh, I see. They're already improved. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the commission? Commissioner, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Clarification, if, if this to pass tonight, um, those streets, as we know, we have a, uh, a committee formed already for improved, unapproved uh, street at Hawk Committee. Um, if to be done, if this street, let's take any street, I don't want to call street, so, but let's say one street now it's done with Cape Seal, down the road, if things change from uh, decisions to be made on from that committee um, that doesn't affect that we cannot make that street improved if we do Cape, Cape Seal today. Correct. It, it, that's right. Right? Yes. Yes. So, so The important thing I think to note is the cycle for maintenance on these unimproved streets is about seven to ten years. Okay. So as you improve these streets now under this maintenance cycle, you have a window of seven to ten years before you need to come back and readdress them. At the same time, you're right, there's an ad hoc unimproved street study committee that's reviewing our 26 miles of unimproved streets in the city Correct. to determine an approach to look at how to address, best address those streets going forward in the future. They, we would not be able to address all of those streets in one year or two years or three years. It, it would be a long-term proposition how that would be done. So the timing of these maintenance cycles, whether it be the maintenance cycles for these projects this year, next year, or the following year, would still be able to be incorporated in anything that you adopt in terms of any policy changes going forward to the future for the unimproved streets. So you're not hindering yourself in any way by making the improvements now that are needed in the light of maybe changing the policy going forward of how these streets are handled. I just wanted the public to be aware of, sure. of that, and I appreciate the clarification on that. Okay. Any questions uh, or comments from the public for staff? If you have them, would you please come to this uh, microphone over here and get in line? And when you come up, if you would give your name and address and then uh, tell us uh, what your comment or concern is. Yes, my name is Tom December. I live at 921 North Adams, part of... One one more thing. Could you spell your last name, please? Just like the month. Tom December. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try to remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am part of the Abbey Terraces Condominium Association, and the proposed street is Wimbledon from Adams to Woodward, right? Now, that's a very heavily traveled street because there's that no left turn, no no access to Wimbledon during 4 to 6 p.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. So you get a lot of traffic there, okay? So you're going to go with Cape Seal, as I understand it, right? Has there been an outreach to the neighborhood in regards to whether or not you would make that a permanent street in terms of a permanent, you know, uh, cement uh, street like they have right next door on Abbey, and uh, that's Abbey, the, the one north. Mohegan. Mohegan, right. 
Yeah, so that's always an option. And then in the literature that we send out in advance of these projects, we always indicate that that's also an alternative route. So, um, so yeah, as part of our communications, we do we do communicate that to to the affected residents. Okay. So, so Mr. December, you may not know uh, that the process is for uh, the neighborhood to circulate a petition to request that the street be improved, which would mean uh, gutters and uh, so forth. So that is an option, and Lakeview took that, took up that option. Right. Well, my only my con not concern, but in terms of that evaluation process, when you have Wimbledon running all the way from Adams all the way to Woodward, I mean, you're talking about six or seven blocks, I would guess. So would you need to get unison for the entire street in order to have that done, or could it be done in sections? From what I understand, policy preference is to keep them together, contiguous. And it wouldn't do mid-blocks. It would have to be the whole stretch. It would have to be the whole stretch. Correct. Okay. All right. Second question. I'm part of the Abbey Terraces Condominium Association. The way our townhouses are configured, we have four units that are actually on Wimbledon, and then six units that are on Adams or Shepherd Bush, that non-existent street per se, and then four units, I believe, on, is it Abbey North? Is that the next street north of Wimbledon? I believe it's Abbey, right? Abbey Street. Yeah. Right. So, as an example, I actually live on Adams, but I was given an assessment. So how is that, how is that calculated? How was that determined? Was it for the entire condominium association, or was it per addresses? Typically the, and I'd have to verify this, and, uh, but typically if it's one parcel, then it's all billed to that, which would be the, the owner of the, all, all of that property. If it's an apartment or condos? Condos. Okay. Then that, that would be split up among all of the homeowners. So it's all of them, even though the majority, two-thirds of it, are not actually facing Wimbledon. Well, no, if they're in Adams' address, they won't be assessed at all. It's just well, the Wimbledon address. But I did get an assessment. Okay. Maybe it's because you were linked to that parcel, but we'll we'll take a look at that again. Yeah, if you there, would, I'm because sure. there's six owners there who are confused because they're not on Wimbledon, but they got an assessment, and I was one of those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if I can just clarify, it is our general policy. If it's a condo, say with ten owners, all ten would be billed the same amount, no matter where they are in the property. Okay. So if you're part of the property that. Right even though that section is just a short section, it's incorporated totally. Right. Okay. All right, the other thing that the board asked me to address was in terms of cost, all right, there's this definition that's uh, something to the effect that, what does it say, $12 per curb foot, $16 per curb foot. Exactly how is the cost determined? Is it based on that one stretch that on Wimbledon per se, that that facing in terms of the total cost? Yeah, it's taken considering the entire length of the street um, and the width of it, so we estimate the amount of materials that'll be required to do that, and then um, it's divided up per linear foot on either side of the street. Then you're subject, so that gives us a per foot cost, and then your assessment is based on what your assessable front footage is, actually, so you, does that make sense? Yeah, so let's assume that it's for, let's assume it's 25 feet, just for sake of argument, right? So if it's $16 per frontage foot or whatever the definition is, is that the total cost? Or which I'm trying to report back to the board in terms of what the financial yeah, commitment so is. So if, if it's fronting that and it's a residential property, it's a percentage of that. So you have your per foot cost, what your total is you pay 85% of it. There's a cost share with the city. Okay. So is that pre-calculated? Can I calculate it or can it be yeah, calculated? I can help you do that. And if we can we can get in touch with that, I can give you a more accurate estimate of those. Okay. Uh, when those notifications were out, things were still somewhat preliminary, having not received bids and things. So it's been fine-tuned since then. Okay. I so I would consult with you in terms of getting a better determination of what the actual cost is. Yep. And I can give you... Um, my contact information. Great. It's helpful. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Christopher Bidlake. I live at 139 Wimbledon Drive. Uh, for the record, it's B-I-D-L-A-K-E. Thank you. Um, so this evening, I just want to voice a couple concerns. Um, I live on Wimbledon. It's obviously a major thoroughfare between Adams and uh, Woodward, between Big Beaver and Maple. Um, so as a result of this, there's, there's a few things that we notice significantly. There's a lot of traffic that does not belong to the neighborhood that is uh, traveling as a cut through. And uh, a lot of this traffic also includes class four through eight vehicles. These are heavy vehicles carrying large loads. And one of the results of this is that um, it causes a lot of damage to the road, uh, particularly, as you mentioned, the um, sinking along the sides, cracking. A lot of my neighbors, we notice where we put rocks out to prevent trucks from driving on our lawns. We'll drive over the rocks. I mean, it, so these vehicles do have an impact on our neighborhood. Um, so my primary concern this evening is not whether or not it's necessary to fix the roads. I think we all agree it's necessary. However, I do have trouble with the 85% cost assessment on the homeowners. I feel that this is unfair and it's particularly disadvantageous given that the residents do not constitute a significant amount of wear as it compares to some of these other vehicles that are traveling along this route. I mean, furthermore, to your comment, uh, Mr. Valentine, I believe that the seven to 10 year uh, durability and maintenance cycle may be appropriate for other roads which are not traveled as heavily, but for Wimbledon, this just does not seem to work. So I guess I would urge the council this evening to um, not approve this amendment as it's written and allow us some time to readdress the way the cost is assessed to the uh, residents, as well as whether or not the Cape Seal is an effective method or the time frame of this is, is you know, substantially worth it, let's say. I would just add in response that what you're asking is really a change in the policy of how these roads are administered. And that discussion is ongoing as part of the ad hoc committee's scope. And they're evaluating not only the structure of the road, the cost of these options, but the policies that drive this process. Mm -hmm. And that structure of how you address certain types of roads and how the cost allocations are allocated is under review currently. Um, but at this point, there's no decisions been made. We anticipate probably toward the end of the year, we'll have some decision and a recommendation on what to do going forward. <clears throat> but in terms of considering it this evening, if they were to consider it, this would be part of the existing policy. Okay. I, I can accept that. I just, I think from, uh, from an impact to the homeowner, I think it's particularly disadvantageous to, to put through this Cape Seal program now, not having reviewed that policy, not having particularly understood the impact that the non-resident travel has on Wimbledon. Is that it? All right, Commissioner Hoff. Well, I want to address something Mr. Bidlake said. Um, I'm not sure if you and Mr. December both are on uh, Wimbledon. Are you saying that you would like to begin the petition process? Are you interested in that? Is that... Uh, formally, I, I'm not sure what the costs are to the homeowner. I have... For, Pardon my ignorance, but I haven't looked into what the homeowner incurred costs are for an improved road. Um, frankly, I don't know if I can afford it, right? So I, I think it's necessary to put those costs in front of the, t the full street, having given all of our neighbors substantial time to review it, make sure we can move forward with it in an appropriate manner. Well, were th were they, weren't they given time to make this decision? Yeah, that's the purpose of the notifications and then the public hearing and, and uh, yep. you know, just formally stating my opinion this evening, and, and I do do understand that there's some homework I have to do as well as a homeowner to to go research and understand what it takes to become an improved road and what those costs associated are. So, understood. Mayor Pro Tem Boutros. I just don't want to complicate things. I want to actually simplify it. And my question, I'll rephrase how I asked the question also earlier, for especially Wimbledon. If we pass this resolution tonight, can they still go back and petition to for their street to be improved, for example. Oh, sure. Before we do the Cape Seal. Can, oh, can, yes. Well, I just want to clarify that because you, that's the, or, or not really. You're, you, if you pass the resolution this evening, you're establishing the necessity that this work be completed. Okay, so they need to be so, because, yeah. Yeah, that's clear. That would have to proceed. Got it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mike Schloff, uh, S-C-H-L-O-F-F. -F. I live at 1850 North Lawn. Uh, this is my fifth cycle of uh, Cape Sealing on North Lawn. I've lived there 34 years. 
A um, couple of questions. North Lawn has all the same uh, issues that Wimbledon does, you know, the cut through traffic. Uh, we have an additional uh, burden, and that's called the Birmingham School District. Uh, all their buses run down North Lawn because Lincoln is too jammed up uh, at many times during the day. So we have a lot of excess wear and tear as well. The other thing that's unique about North Lawn, though, Birmingham abuts North Lawn on the south end of the city. On the other side of North Lawn is Birmingham Country Club, which I understand is Bloomfield Township. Correct. correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct. The question we have, my neighbors up and down North Lawn, is we only have Birmingham residents on one side of North Lawn, and yet we get assessed per frontage foot um, for the cape ceiling, and I said five times going. And they do a nice job, by the way, I have to tell you. But the question I have is, um, does Birmingham own that road surface full width and full length? Yes, it's a they Birmingham do. road, and then for purposes of the assessment, um, it's not as if the people on the one side of the road are billed double. Uh, it's just that's the first absorbed by the city okay. for the portion, yeah, because they're not taxable. Oh. It's not a taxable jurisdiction. Okay, does Bloomfield Township share on the cost? No. Oh my God, because their trucks use that damn road every day. <laughs> Sod trucks, uh, uh, earth movers, and everything. Has the city ever attempted to uh, share the cost with? that entity which uses the road as much uh, or more than the residents? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, and could you look into that? I mean, it would seem to me, uh, and again, my question doesn't address the necessity. It addresses the necessity of, of a fair and equitable sharing of the cost, which ultimately is going to come down. So I don't know why, in the unique case of North Lawn, that's never been examined. In other words, we're essentially paying double by paying by only half of the abutting homeowners being, being taxed for it. You see what I'm saying? Bloomfield Township and that golf course gets a free ride. They get a new and improved road. They don't pay a damn nickel. So why can't the city approach uh, Bloomfield Township or, I don't know, maybe it would be the Birmingham, uh, the Birmingham Country Club and, and ask that they join in the cost of improving their road. Their, that road is every much their road as it is mine. I simply drive a 2,000-pound SUV. They drive sod trucks. So that's my only comment. It's a valid comment. I think the, the concern is that the road itself, you're not charged for who uses the road. It's simply for the maintenance of the road. So when you think of these as gravel roads, the only thing that's being done is the maintenance of the gravel road. The trucks that drive it, the cars that drive it, the buses that drive it are really irrelevant to the discussion under the current policy because it's not who drives on the road, it's who's adjoining the road that the cost is assessed to. Well, who adjoins it on, on the south side? Bloomfield Township. They do. And they don't pay a nickel. And the city cannot assess them. They can't assess them, but they could certainly approach them and, and uh, negotiate with them at a minimum. You have a very fine city attorney sitting behind you, Mr. Curry. <laughs> <laughs> I've known him a long time. Curry was just advising me there's no legal basis for them to pay that unless they voluntarily agreed to. We would be happy to ask them if they would like to do that. That would be great. We can do that. <laughs> Thank you, man. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Thanks to the answer. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, Anthony and Sarah, ANSARA 176 Wimbledon. Um, I just had a couple questions about, so the Cape Seal is five to seven years, right? And then if you do an improved road, what's the lifespan on that? I mean, Paul would speak to that, but concrete, you're looking at... Yeah, we would hope you get at least 40 years. Okay. And so he said that he had, he had 35 years, they had it done five times. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, the, it, it seems like it'd be a better deal, obviously, just to do that. And then one more question. Um, for the petition, does it have to be unanimous? Every every person on the street has to agree to it, or is it no, majority? No. Yeah. No, no, the process starts if you get over 50%, um, but the final call is always up to the city commission. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Duffy, 700, Wimbledon, D-U-F-F-Y. Good you. evening. Um, just a couple of questions on the reclassification or the getting an improved road. Uh, where do you acquire literature on the costs on that? So you said to start a petition and tell somebody what you know whether they want it or not. But where do we get the literature? Do we have to attend the ad hoc committee? No, just feel free to call the engineering department office during working hours, and we can have a conversation with you and give you all your, all the details. Okay. Can you give that number, Paul? Sure. Five three zero one eight five zero one eight five zero one eight five zero. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I echo some of the homeowners' comments here. 
particularly uh, Bid Lake's comments um, regarding the traffic that these uh, streets undergo. It seems as though there's a need to push through a lot of the uh, streets that are really damaged, um, where there's a lot of other ones that are in the neighborhood that aren't being underneath this, or, uh, this, this Cape Seal pr program that we have right now. So the question back to the Mayor Pro Tem here of, if you pay it once, you're going to pay it again if you submit the petition. So then you're going to end up getting doubled up. If your street, if your neighbors agree that they would like to have their street improved, once that is done, the city maintains the street thereafter. Right. Does the city take into, into account the cost that was just put in for the Cape Seal? No. If that, no. Okay, so then you will be you will be oh, doubled up. Is my point. Well, twice. things don't happen that fast. Sure. And uh, your street needs improvement now. If you had uh, petitioned as Lakeview did earlier in the process, in that case, you may have achieved the number that you need to have the street improved. But uh, obviously that didn't occur to your, you or your neighbors early in the process. A couple other questions. Um, you said you, you conducted a bid. Is it complete? The bid for the bid prices, yes. That's how many bidders? Two. Two only? Yep. How many rounds? How many rounds? One round of bidding? One round. Is there a reason why they can't be put off till after the policy is reviewed and sounds like it's changing? Is there light that can be shed to the public on what that policy may, may be in the future? I could speculate, but at this point, they're not far enough along in the process to have any formal recommendations to present. Okay. So I don't have that information for you, which is why this process is proceeding because this general right. maintenance needs to occur. Our side. I think we're Sherman. So, so we've had a, a number of people from Wimbledon who have come up. Thank you. Just in generalities, um, w when we replace a street, when it becomes a permanent street, um, the, the general calculation has been for the last couple of years at about $195 per linear foot. So that gives you an idea. So here we're talking about uh, for Wimbledon, uh, $10.66 is what's in our materials. So it is more expensive. It's paid over 10 years. Um, it is the same. Currently, it is still this, it is the 85% is paid by the homeowner, 15% is paid by the city. Uh, it requires a petition. And if you go online and you look at the packet of materials from this meeting, you'll see that there is a project report for Lakeview that goes through some of the details. Um, I, I remember, I was just asking the city manager, I remember one time where we had a street that we indicated needed to be updated, and between the time that they, we found the, the notice where we, we said that there was necessity, which is what we're doing tonight, or would be if, we, if it passes, that's what we're doing tonight, and set the assessment, they came in with a petition uh, approved by more than half the street. And so that way they weren't paying for the improvement on the Cape Seal, but instead they were going towards uh, full improvement of the street. Once the street is improved, after it's, you have 10 years to pay for it, after that it's then the city's responsibility to maintain that street. So you don't have every five, seven, 10 years a uh, Cape Seal uh, assessment. So I throw that out there as just information. Um, you know, there, I think there were three or four people from Wimbledon, so there might be an interest there. Um, improving these streets is the way to go. It, it does eliminate that. It improves drainage on the street. Uh, you then get leaf pickup along with it. So there are a number of benefits that go with it. It also, you know, it, it just improves the look of the neighborhood. So uh, having, having done this on my street, uh, I'm a fan. Uh, it, it hurts a little bit. I'll admit that. You know, the, the writing that check uh, either at the beginning or once a year for 10 years, it's not necessarily the most pleasant thing, but you do it. And what we found, at least in, in most cases, property values go up accordingly because the neighborhood looks better. So I throw that out there. Um, 
and you know that's just by way of background information. And again, if you go back, to, if you go and look at the materials that are online in the agenda, you'll see that there is a proposed project report for Lakeview. It give you, it'll give you a real good idea of what's involved and in costs and things like that. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. I'm Shirley Sinelli. I live at 1908 Sheffield Road, and I'm here just with a couple of questions. That's fine. Could you spell your last name, please? S, like Sam, I-N-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I, my uh, question, first of all, is that Sheffield is considered a major artery, and we are assessed as residents the same amount as just the other residential uh, streets are and traffic has increased greatly on Sheffield Road during the last few years especially since all the build up over there on the other side of Eaton so the capes the ceiling doesn't last as long as it used to I've lived at Matt House for almost 70 years and at the time of doing the uh, uh, improvements keeps incre uh, decreasing and so anyway that and also uh, I w uh, had hoped that they have a different company than they had the last time. I've, it didn't appear that uh, some of the streets held up very well after, in a very short period of time after. Uh, others have raised questions that uh, have already been answered. So, But mainly, again, back to the difference be at, between Sheffield and uh, some of the other resident, I live on the corner in, of a, a residential street and I don't pay of course as much because I have them both, I'm on the corner, but uh, at any rate. And, and you wondered if this is the same company? Is that your well, question? Well, basically whether uh, an, uh, a, a major artery pays the same has the same assessment as just the regular residential streets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, and again, under the current policy, there's no differentiation between who uses the street and the condition of the road, uh, the condition of the street. So to say that there's higher traffic on this street as opposed to that street, as long as that street is a gravel road, it falls under the policy that's, that exists currently. So major arteries pay the same amount. Basically. Correct. Okay. And then also, do you have the same company? Oh, so we haven't awarded that yet. It bid out. Um, I'm prepared to recommend the company that's been longstanding um, working with us. Um, they were significantly lower on, on bid prices, so I do rec anticipate re making that recommendation. That has not yet been made. Um, that'll potentially occur next meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Danny Seidman, I'm at 652 Wimbledon. It's S is in Sam, E I D like David, M A N. Um, so, a question about the um, the Cape Seal program is that something that occurs annually, that assessment? More or less, yeah. There have been times where it hasn't, but generally, yes. Well, let me clarify. The, the assessment that occurs oh. annually mm -hmm. is up to a 10 year period once it's completed. I'm sorry, I thought you meant evaluation. <laughs> Excuse me. He's, he's asking about the Cape Seal program, not the improve, not the permanent street. Oh, oh okay. Like how, how often is the city looking at um, performing the Cape Seal? Is it certain streets every year? Every other yes. year? Yes. Yes. Every okay. year we, uh, the engineering department examines the roads <clears throat> and decides which are in most need of improvement. By that I mean a Cape Seal for the unimproved mm -hmm. streets. But your street, once it's Cape Sealed, will, un, it's unlikely it would be eligible again for quite a few years. Right. And um, again, forgive me, I'm a bit of a, a rookie here, new to the neighborhood in 2016, but uh, um, regarding the, um, so in my opinion, like uh, the road is, you know, it's it's been in need of repair for the last three years at least. That's, you know, as far as I go back. Um, but I think there's, it sounds like there's enough interest from my neighbors and I in Wimbledon um, to a, at least attempt to find some recourse to push back a decision. Now, is the, the resolution at hand is to kind of approve all of this? Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so is there any way that we could possibly, you know, remove Wimbledon from that and maybe consider it uh, for next year? 
um, so that the citizens can have a chance to you know, work, work up a petition and uh, so that we're not kind of sinking costs into a Cape Seal when it's, it sounds like there's a ton of interest to have an improved road. They have until July 22nd. That's the hearing of confirmation. So the decision tonight is whether it, the streets that have been presented are sufficiently in need of Cape Seal. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll say tonight. On July 22nd is the hearing of confirmation, which would seal the deal, you could say. So you have a couple of weeks <laughs> to get your, yeah, that's funny, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so is it, you being be approved done. tonight also? It, it can be done yeah. that you can uh, get to your neighbors with the petition and get it into the city to turn a Cape Sealed Road into an improved road. It, Commissioner Sherman. I was just going to say, David Bloom is in the audience. David, uh, if I could, how, how long did it take to circulate a petition on Stanley? Probably a few weeks to a month. It just depends. To actually get all the signatures? Don't need all of them, need enough. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry? Couple weeks. So, all right, David. Okay. Since this is televised and uh, the microphone won't pick up Mr. Bloom's comments, uh, he, apparently uh, David Bloom was involved on Stanley in obtaining signatures to uh, have that road improved, and he reports that it took a couple of weeks to get the sufficient number of signatures. You don't need everyone to sign. Mm -hmm. Just greater than fifty percent. It sounds like. fifty-one percent. One percent. Okay, and just to clarify, so Lakeview is um, is getting approved tonight as part of this, and then they or they're not. No, no. So let's clarify. Okay. Lakeview has obtained a petition already that has 54 percent majority in favor of improving the street. Mm -hmm. For that re reason, it's been removed from the necessity um, public hearing this evening. Mm -hmm. If another street wanted to proceed with trying to obtain a majority petition to have their street improved, and talking to the city attorney. We could approve the necessity this evening, but if you come back prior to confirmation, it could be removed at the time of confirmation if that majority petition exists. Okay. Now, the time frame is going to be tough because you have a two-week window, but we need to have that information in prior to that meeting happening for that determination to be made. Uh, how soon prior? I think to be fair, <laughs> we'd want to have it the Friday before the Monday meeting so it can be evaluated and a recommendation could be made. Okay. Commissioner Hoff? My suggestion would be uh, to contact Mr. O'Meara. He has the petitions, he has the whole process so that you know what's involved and you get an idea of what the cost would be. Uh, Commissioner Sherman mentioned it. It's a significant difference between Cape Sealing and permanent, but permanent is permanent. And so, but this is the information you need when you go door to door asking your neighbors. They want to know how much it's going to cost. So you have to have the comparison figures and Mr. O'Meara could provide that. Okay, so I think we all understand the logistical challenges with completing this. Is there any other option for recourse for removing Wimbledon from consideration this year other than a 51% petition? Can we take a pass and be first next year? Yes. Yeah. Submit a petition and so the problem I see, and perhaps another commissioner will have another thought, but the problem I see is that you do not have every homeowner here to say, yeah, I want to wait. And it could be that a majority of the homeowners don't want to wait. And if we take it off tonight, we will have done something that a potential majority wanted. Mm -hmm. and. Everyone got the notice and knew what was coming. So uh, from, from my point of view, to disadvantage people who aren't here to speak uh, is a bit of a problem from my perspective. Okay. Is, is any, uh, Commissioner it, Harris? Just a question for staff on the process. Even if we approve the resolution determining a necessity tonight, obviously we talked about the opportunity to gather the requisite signatures 
for an improved street, but the commission would also consider additional correspondence if, hypothetically, residents wanted to delay um, the Cape Seal for one year. We, we would consider that before the approval on July 22nd as well, or we'd have the opportunity to review that as well. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And that's what I was going to say as well, is maybe we can circulate a, a more brief um, uh, petition with signatures to at least delay while we consider for the future um, and bring that on the 22nd versus actually trying to push through something like an improved street with a 10-day window, essentially. So if you can get the signatures on a petition to delay, you should be able to achieve signatures for improved street, it seems to me. But do what you can do. I guess the, the biggest make, difference make, is committing to the cost. You know, satisfy on yourself on, on this issue. Uh, if that is the way, you can try that. Mayor Pro Tem Boutros. And I'm Mayor, if I may, I, I sit on that committee of improve and unimproved street. And I'll tell you personally, I believe uh, Cape Seal is putting a band aid on a wound. It's not really healing the wound. That's pers my personal opinion. Uh, as our city manager explained earlier, we're very mm -hmm. early in the process to change anything. Even the petition initiation to me, that's ridiculous, excuse my language, for a resident to knock on doors and go create that uh, discomfort between you and your neighbor, whether he agrees or he doesn't, but that's my personal opinion. And we're not here to discuss this tonight, but just for you to be aware, we're taking this very, very seriously. But the biggest challenge is not just that, uh, who initiated the who will start initiating the petition. Hopefully, the results in the future will be staffing, not residents, but then residents will still have the right to come here and object. But let us start the petition, if that to change. But but the most, I think, since I sat on that committee, the most challenging thing is the money. Right now, I've been hearing from several uh, residents that came up, it's, they're complaining about that they're paying more than they're supposed to because there is other people using that road and it's a main road. You don't think it's that easy, and I want you to understand, you're only one resident here speaking for the neighborhood. The money is gonna be triple, I'm not sure. But it's significant change. So you have to go back with the clarity of the money is going to be a lot more. But yes, personally, improve is the solution, mm -hmm. not just Cape Seal. But they have to understand that and what the petition is for. And we don't want to go back in a year from now. They're complaining about the money and we're back to today. What we're making decision on today that it's a necessity and must, something must be done. You follow what I'm saying? In a sense, we need to have a clarity which direction we need to go also. And if, if we approve it tonight, you've got two weeks, make sure the message is very well given to the residents. And if you have any further question, please clarify it with Paul or this, our city manager. So in two weeks from now, we're confident to move forward because we can't just leave the street with the unknown. That's just my opinion. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I agree. It's definitely in need of repair. And I, I do think for the citizens whose concern is, um, you know, paying the cost for someone else, the best way to allay that is to improve the roads. And then in 10 years, it becomes somebody else's cost instead of the uh, people on Wimbledon. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bloom? Um, David Bloom on Stanley. Sir? Um, sir? Yes. You're going to want to get more than 51% of your, your neighbors in case, one, someone changes their mind. Number two, I went through this process on my street. I've seen other streets attending city commission meetings go through the process. Historically, the city commission has not approved these kind of things unless it's above 60%, two-thirds, three-quarters. Two-thirds is probably a safe way to go. This is a really big bill. It's, it's probably, if it's $20 for Cape Seal and it's $200 for curbs and gutters, that's, that's 10 times more. And so it is a big bill. It makes your street nicer. Um, but, you know, you, you should probably make sure that you've got more than 51% of your neighbors support for this. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Clinton Valor, 822 Shirley. B like boy, A-L-L-E-R. I wanted to give some advice uh, to the people on Wimbledon and anyone else who's watching or listening who wants to do this. I did it twice, and I think you got excellent advice from the commission tonight. Uh, and I would just add a couple of things. The engineering department is very flexible in the widths, street widths 
and curb design. So if you go through, for example, the Holy Name area, you'll see ro uh, what they call drive up or roll up curbs. Uh, they actually put dye in the curbs on wi Willets, on the Willets Hill. On Greenwood, we got four inch square curbs. There's larger curbs, so you can, you can get the curb width. There's Watkins was done at 19 feet, the 19 feet. There's arrangements so that you can park on one side, you can park on both sides. So there's a lot of flexibility, which helps you politically when you're trying to sell this. You don't have to sell the design to get the signature. Get the signature and then work on the design. Uh, uh, the other thing is what constitutes a signature on a petition, and I would ask uh, the city attorney to opine on that, because I think at one time I asked you, and you said that uh, cards, like a, a, a postcard, might be acceptable. Maybe today an email or something like that. Something that's simpler than going around door to door and trying to find people home and get them to sign something. So uh, that might help you. We have established procedures with the engineering department on how that's to be done. So that's what we follow. I would just reaffirm that anybody that has questions, Paul, do you want to stand up for a minute? Anybody that has questions relative to this process, feel free to contact Mr. O'Meara in the engineering department <laughs> because I think you'll get you know, the clarity that you're looking for um, from the engineering department first and foremost. And uh, you can reach him again at Mr. O'Meara, your number? 530-1850. 530-1850. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for your comments. I'm closing the public hearing. I have one latecomer. I'm going to re sort of reopen. Good evening, Dominic Police. P like Peter, U-L-I-S. I'm an 824 Wimbledon. Just want to go on the record that there's one more of us here. Uh, I'm a big fan of due process. It's clear the residents have some homework to do. Appreciate the time and the education and the, and the opportunity to squeeze in with a potential you know, a permanent solution for the street. Thank you. All right. The public hearing is officially closed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Commissioners. Commissioner Sherman. I'm going to move the suggested resolution finding necessity for these streets. Second. Okay. Comments from the Commission? Comments from the public? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all for your uh, concerns, expressing your concerns. We're moving on, but I'd like the audience to be quiet, please. Could we have, it's disturbing up here. If you want to talk, take it outside, please. We're moving on now to a um, update on our master plan. We have a, a charrette summary, and I believe, although where are they? Oh, sitting way in the back. We have two people that have been involved with our master planning, and they're going to come up, I think, and talk to us about that. Yes. Matt, do you want to introduce yourself before you start? Sure. After the, you know, the shuffle quiets down and so forth, um, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Matthew Lambert, uh, partner with DPZ and project manager of the consultant team uh, for the master plan process. Uh, I hope my voice holds out, especially for the next two days, because we've been talking nonstop um, all day today. Uh, I'll give you a little update on, on that first. But, but as a warning, at the end, I, I want to come back around and, and ask you all if you have other issues that we haven't yet touched on um, that we should be building into the first draft of the master plan. At this point, we haven't started to write the first master plan draft. We've just begun to uh, elicit um, input and to begin to put some proposals together. And right now, we're testing those proposals, discussing those with people. Following this, we'll begin writing a first draft of that plan uh, with the goal of having that draft available for review at the end of September. Okay. okay. So the materials that we have in the package, or our agenda package tonight, what, what is this? this? This is just a summary of what was discussed at the Charette with a little more detail on the specific items. And so we put this together to accompany 
a survey. So there's a second survey that's open right now, uh, just opened um, at the end of last week. And that survey is asking the public for a specific input on each of the proposal items that you'll find in this document. So rather than uh, having people watch the two hour closing presentation and the other videos, um, we put this together so they could have a better understanding of the proposals at hand and so you could have a better understanding of them as well. And since you mentioned the survey, can you uh, tell everyone how they can get to that survey? Absolutely. So the, the survey and a PDF copy of this document, as well as all the videos from the charrette, are available on the project's website, thebirminghamplan.com. If you go to the tab called Documents, there you will find um, a link to this summary document and links to all the videos. If you go to the tab um, called Participate, the Participate tab has a link to the survey. Um, so all the information is, is available there. Um, anything else on the website, Sarah? Okay, yes, yeah, so the city's also provided some links to these documents um, and the survey, and we'll, we'll be sharing it out as well on the project Facebook page, and the city is also sharing this uh, yet again there, and I believe on, on Nextdoor. Okay, so, um, so the official site is Birmingham Plan. The, the Birmingham Plan. And is there any capitalization? No, it's irrelevant. The Birmingham Plan dot com. Yes, and okay. there's also an, an open, um, an open input item there too. You can you can submit any comment that doesn't have to be with the survey. The survey does have open comments at the end, um, and I, I will uh, specify, as, especially for for the public, that this one is longer than the prior survey. This one, on, on average, is taking people about 25 minutes to complete, but it's because we ask for an opinion on everything that's proposed so far in the charrette so that we have that information going forward into the master plan document. Okay. So I urge people to go on the official website because it has everything that you'd ever want to know about the master plan, thebirminghamplan.com. But you can also get to it through our uh, city website. Yes. Okay. Um, as, as well, please come by, uh, as, as uh, the mayor announced earlier this evening, please come by the uh, drop-in clinic at 255 South Old Woodward, um, where we spent the entire day, Sarah and I, uh, speaking to people, um, most of whom actually had not been able to attend the charrette. So that was very helpful to be able to orient people to the purpose of a master plan, to the process that we've gone through so far, and to the structure of our proposals, you know, organized into these nine areas um, and so forth. So we, we have that for the next two days. Um, tomorrow evening, we're, we're working on meeting with the President's Council of Neighborhood Associations. And on Wednesday, we'll be back in front of the planning board as well, so we're trying to put together a lot of this um, interaction with the public, uh, with yourselves, with the planning board, um, and with the neighborhood associations, as well since this really affects the, the city overall and, and everyone in it. So uh, when you say you're meeting with these different groups, uh, is that interfering with the 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m.? It's outside of that time frame. Okay, good. So people can drop in, it's not, don't need an appointment. Yes. You don't have to call ahead or Any, wave a flag. You can just drop in and uh, see what's happening and give your opinion. And we'll, we'll, we'll get our lunch when we can, but, but we're, we're, we're going at it 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. each of these days. All right, so someone who's working and coming well, not, in. Uh, we're, we're at the studio. We're, we're at the, the drop-in clinic, 9 a.m. to 7.30. Ah. And then we have you know this meeting, oh, the planning board meeting, and evening meetings and so forth. Okay, Commissioner Hoff. Matt, are you going to go through any of this tonight, or do you want uh, questions? Do you want comments? I uh, are you going I, through? It? I don't need to go through it. Um, you don't plan to go through it. I don't plan to go through it. Um, what I what I'd like to ask is is if there are things that that you each think uh, that any of you think that we should add to the the scope or things that we haven't um, uh, touched on in what we've put together so far and what, what, we've, what we've discussed. And, and I know that there's, there's items that we have from, uh, from our pre charette meetings. For example, a lot of people, and we've heard it a bit uh, here too, uh, spoke about cut through traffic. 
and uh, there are ways that we are looking at addressing cut through traffic in some of these proposals, but they weren't clearly um, identified through the charrette process. So that's something that I know we have to uh, touch on um, that hasn't been uh, clarified. And you know, obviously there is also the unimproved streets, which uh, requires coordination after the the committee um, comes through with their recommendations, but that has an impact on the master plan. Um, so I'd, I'd actually like to um, to open it to you all for, for for questions and and suggestions, unless you'd like me to go through any of the information. What is the plan, Mayor? Uh, I didn't know that there was, were options, but I think it would be helpful if any of us have uh, items that we did not see yet in here that would uh, be helpful to be explored. Commissioner DeWeese? Not an item to add, but an item to reconsider. Uh, you've made a real case for uh, neighborhood associations and identifying them and making them stronger. And part of that, you suggest a new meeting hall for Birmingham at Barnum Park. Uh, you might want to think about that a second time. Historically, the meeting hall for Birmingham has been the community house, and it's right here in our Civic Center. You also, with the changes we're making in the library, have space there. So the real critical thing I see that you're talking about is to have a meeting place where associations can get together. You might want to follow up with the library and with the community house and or others to see if there's really a need to build a new meeting hall. Uh, I think you can make a case that you have a need based on what you're proposing, but I don't think there's a case that you want the city to have to build a city building when we might, as a city, like we do other community services, even pay uh, for our services rendered, and we can potentially provide rent or whatever and strengthen those institutions as opposed to weaken them by being in competition. So reconsider that. Uh, I, my wife and I have been big supporters of Barnum Park. Uh, it, it would be nice to have something like that at Barnum Park. But I think it's more appropriate that it's in town, and that's more central for everybody if we get our act together. So just reconsider your proposal there. Okay, Commissioner Hoff. Well, what I wanted to mention is the first part of the um, materials focuses on parking, and parking is a big issue, and especially neighborhood parking. And you have accurately assessed the many different variations in our neighborhoods for permit parking and limited time parking and no parking. And one of the things, your, your suggestion is to have just maybe three conditions, and I think that's a very uh, valid suggestion. But one of the options is two-hour hour parking. And it's my understanding that the police are no longer allowed to enforce that by marking tires. So I would ask that you take that into consideration. It's a good option, but how will it be enforced? And there's no point in coming up with ideas that can't be enforced. And so um, that's one of your the three options, and I just ask that you consider that. How will it be enforced? Yeah, we'll follow up with the police and uh, Jacobs, who's a consultant on parking. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, uh, Commissioner Nikita? Thanks. Glad you remember. <laughs> no, it was because I had something to say, and I'm debating if I'm going to let you go first or me. Uh, if you want, I'm, I'm more than happy to refrain and no, allow you. You do. You go um, right ahead. Because you know um, i got a couple things. Yeah, um, I figured. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll try to be brief because we don't want to get in the weeds, but I wanted to put forth a couple things that, that in we've, we've talked a lot. I was there, I was in the Charette uh, room earlier today. Um, just a couple things I wanted to uh, make sure that we clarify or refine and a couple things that, that we I, I haven't seen really fully looked at. So I think we want to touch upon maybe looking at those as we go forward. So one is uh, we talked a bit about lot combinations and uh, as you know, we've had issues with lot splits and lot combinations. We refined our ordinance to accommodate a lot combination uh, review, which 
is, in my opinion, flawed, still needs to be reviewed, as we found in our first uh, iteration of that, that it doesn't really uh, address the issue properly. But more importantly is, in the master plan, there should be some, um, some uh, direction as to where possibly a lot combination might uh, be appropriate long term and maybe certain streets in certain parts of the city where where um, the potential for larger lots is actually encouraged uh, versus others where it's not so I think some some at least uh, thought and, and development of that and direction in that I think would be important so uh, that's one thing the uh, another is uh, just a couple clarifications in the rail district. We had the rail district plan that goes back to 1999, and there are a number of initiatives that we put in that plan that we've worked on over the years as we've implemented that plan, uh, namely some particular streets and the placement of new buildings and the accommodation of streets cutting from one place to another and sort of setting the stage for the grid to expand and allow for the network to be a little bit more integrated. and. In the newer plan or the updated revision, as you're putting forth in the in the uh, in the <clears throat> in the master plan, you've you've shown some of those with the red line uh, where the streets would go through and what have you. But I think in the you know what we found over the years is as clear as the master plan can be, whatever plan it would be, whether it's a, a sub area plan like the rail district plan or any of the others, or the master plan in general, as clear as it can be. It's going to help us implement it over time, because um, the the plan, you know, really sets the stage. So if the plan can be specific enough and detailed enough and clear enough, it's going to help, I think, overall. And my thought was that some of the renderings, or specifically that aerial rendering, which I think is fine, but um, maybe more clearly dictate. Uh, 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 articulate some of these changes so that the vision, if you will, because that's kind of a vision document, that vision image is really representative more so of the idea. So again, more information that really clarifies the intent of what we're in, what we would like to see happen over time. So um, just, uh, it's really about communication more so than anything. I think making sure that the plans and the renderings are really strong in that if, if I may on, on that, just to su suggest, because there um, and, and what we've discussed is um, sort of a short-term uh, interim approach that it may be best that we illustrate the interim and the long-term um, together in the same hand in sequence so mm -hmm. that that's well understood. Good point, and I, I want to follow up on that at the at the end. A couple more points before, but that's that's a good lead-in because I want to talk about interim and short-term and long-term, because I think that's really important as well. Um, another issue is that I think needs some clarification is the South Woodward District that um, is clearly moving toward looking at the alleyways or the laneways as sort of a focal pedestrian zone from 14 Mile to, to or from Lincoln to 14 Mile, right? Um, and, and I think that's fine in the renderings that we have. We have a couple of iterations of renderings that show a different ways of how Woodward would be articulated and developed over time. But the alley is sort of consistent as a place where, where there would be some, some inward focusing, uh, residential and or commercial or mixed use, however it would be done. Uh, I think that's fine, but the, the, it seems like the orientation or the primary, the way it's being presented now, is that the idea of basically clear-cutting the entire block along Woodward and essentially building new and building back toward the alley um, is kind of the preferred way that we would go. And my, my recommendation or suggestion or concern would be that that's not the nature of Woodward overall, and it's probably um, more of a, a long-term strategy if, if not... Um, really something that would likely happen. So I would say that maybe something that would be more likely, which would be the other sketch that you've done, which is the buildings holding the corners, maybe existing or new, and then having a mid-block uh, uh, parking situation. And that system being more of the sort of, if you will, preferred or logical or, or more potentially um, developed than the alternative. So they, they both have options, but I think one one is more likely and I think should be illustrated as likely the more more 
typical situation. So the just really how it's presented. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about, but I think it's just the way it's coming out and the, the images that we've had so far is it's it seems to be oriented toward the one versus the other. And to me, that seems like that's, that's um, not where we're likely going to go or where we would prefer to go, in my mind. Um, the other point is uh, the retail zone that you have. <coughs> uh, at the north end and the south end, the north end being the market district, the south end being the uh, the Haynes Square district. Um, we have, I forget the terms, there's two layers of retail, one sort of high primary priority. Primary and secondary. Primary and secondary, yeah. okay. So the only thing that I would say is that just refinement on that, because again, the, we want the master plan to be clear enough to give us the basis to move forward. On the north end, Right now, we have a very strong west side at the at the corner of ha uh, Harmon and, and Old Woodward. And what you have is you show it as secondary on the west side. I would say that that's already primary currently, and I would I would hate to see it, meaning where Scalopini's yeah, is. Yeah, the, the few businesses that, that are there. Yeah, the, the, that block is primary right now. Yeah. And that creates a four, essentially a main main, if you will, of that district. Yes. And so I would show that as, as a primary on the one side and a primary on the other. Right now you have it on the east side, not the west side. So just yeah. some refinement in terms of the details, because again, it sets the stage for where we go on implementation. And then lastly on that is on the south end, where we have the potential of articulating Old Woodward differently. I think we need to think about how that would be, in terms of the retail prime, uh, uh, direction, how it would be without the articulation, meaning short going back to short term, long term, because we may or may not, you know, it may be many years before we rearticulate, you know, old, you know, old Woodward or you go change it, right? So how is that defined currently or in the near term before that? And it's not I mean, shown that prior way. prior to prior to the recommendations change. for the square and exactly. all those things. So there's sort of a before and after, if you will. And I, I don't know how you want to address it, but it just right now we're we're only showing it sort of after. Yeah. And that means that from now until we ever do that, if we ever do that, we don't really show the recommendation of what it would be. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to have something sort of now, and then as we would change it, and Haines Square becomes something else, then we have a recommendation of how we would see that implemented. So, I, you know, again, I, how, how we do I'm just bringing up the clarity issues that, that I think are somewhat important. Um, now, just on uh, two other points uh, on, on, on overall things that I don't think are addressed quite yet. Um, we talked early on in some, some discussions about the assets of the neighborhoods and the commercial districts and the idea of having a, um, some stronger or evident linkages in terms of priorities and secondary. And we have a grid that, you know, we have a neighborhood grid of streets and sidewalks and all that. But there, there are certain places where streets are clearly the, the connector, you know, between the rail district and and the Triangle District Bowers is a clear connector, for example. It comes through and it's sort of illogical. So the question is in the master plan, would we have some of these areas have, take on some other, uh, you know, extra level of articulation in either pedestrian zone, non-motorized or and or landscape and or street condition? I mean, I, I don't I don't know, but it's just, it's a, it's a question of whether or not we've addressed the idea of, of stronger linkages between the assets of the city. There are actually inherently there now, but really not embellished. <clears throat> so I think that's a question of you know, do we have an opportunity there that we, you know, and and I haven't seen much discussion about that, but I think that would be worthy of a of a bit of, of a bit of a dialogue. And um, just today. Um, uh, Tory, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is already wider, um, and, and actually a, a good alternative bike route to to Eaton, for example, yeah. for for people that don't want to ride in that traffic condition. Exactly, okay, as an example of that. Or people who th who want to get from place to place and want to use a certain street that because it's articulated a little differently. Maybe the sidewalks are a little bit wider. I mean, I, I think of the uh, the cultural path in Indianapolis, for example. If you're familiar with that. Not saying that that's the answer, but there's clearly a defined. I mean, the lighting, there's seating, there's certain conditions that happen that allow that path to sort of happen, and people walk and ride there and all that. Same thing in in you know in the city here. We have uh, we have the green loop, and there's. A, I'm not saying that's the answer, but I'm saying you, you understand. There's certain priorities are higher hierarchy, um, streets and, and pathways that might have an opportunity for something beyond what's just there. And you know? a, a related question and sort of has to do with the unimproved roadways and what standard is being used when you're improving those roadways. And, and we've, we've identified earlier on 
and, and some of our analysis documents, uh, which we'll share, uh, which, which streets took on those roles. Um, and that provides the ability to uh, identify those, those standards, those ideal conditions that those streets might become in the future. Mm -hmm. And that affects uh, a lot the consideration of improvements and what those improvements look like. Yeah, and that leads me to one other point is the street width um, uh, discussion, which I think there's been some. But, you know, we've struggled with recommendations of very, very wide residential streets that should be narrower, in my opinion, and we struggle with whether or not you know, they, they, we have uh, a clarity of what the goal should be in neighborhoods going from 32 foot wide streets to 27 foot wide streets. And what are the pros and cons of that? And what is the master plan really saying to accommodate the streets so they're safer and more proper pedestrian zones and, and stronger for the neighborhoods and adding green space and landscape and those kinds of things. And I think that there's a lot of mixture of things that have happened over the course of 200 years here. So does the master plan help to really define some, some, some standards that we could go for that, again, gives us some basis for when we come to redoing a street, we actually have some strength behind the, the, the larger scale thinking that helps to justify narrowing a street um, when it's really too wide and accommodating. Yeah, I think the, the, the structure, the sort of core seam destination and connections between those, that structure can inform that decision-making yeah. process, I that, believe. That would be helpful. I think that's really needed because I think that that depth of understanding of where we're going. And lastly, one last point is uh, there's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, our facility here next, the, the senior facility that we had. And um, we know that the, that that facility is in a, um, it's a stable condition, but we're using a, a facility that's, you know, not ours, it's not the city's. It's, We're doing know, a lot in a limited space. Right, and going to Commissioner DeWeese's point uh, about civic buildings or buildings that the city um, may consider long-term, and we're talking about a master plan, we're talking about long-term, um, accommodating possibly a direction for that to find a home that's more of a permanent home that's a civic building of substance, um, not a school that we don't really have control of that may or may not be, you know, we, we it, it, there's an opportunity there in the master plan to address it in some capacity, and I, and I haven't heard much about that yet. So I think that was the other thing. So um, we have heard from uh, from a lot of um, older members of the community um, about sure. next and and the good that it does, but the need for for facilities. Yeah, we're, we're, it's definitely on many of our minds, surely, because it's a, it's a very, very important aspect of the city, and it's somewhat unresolved in the sense of where it's going long term. And then just to follow up the last point on implementation is in our master plan, in our, in our downtown master plan, with, which DPZ did, um, we had part of the success that we've had is the fact that we've had short-term and long-term, you know, short-term being, you know, let's let's put outdoor seating out, long-term being let's expand Bates Street and make a great part of the downtown, you know, that really enhances the city. You know, those are, those are short-term and long-term. Some of them we got done right away, some of them took a little longer, you know, and, um, but we'll get done. So these are things that, that um, I think these, these are things that helped us implement and so we had some 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 low hanging fruit, if you will. So I would say again, in your implementation, you already you already took you already commented on it, but I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm adding to the point of importance from our job on implementation, and we've been very successful with implementing our plans overall. Is that plan is helpful if we have a number of things that are easy to achieve or easier to achieve, and other things, you know, so short term and long term gains, and we continue to work on, on getting it done. So um, I encourage the development of that as part of the plan once, once we, yeah. you know, from that up. So. And that, that helps for the, the clarity asked of, you know, what this document is, the, the charrette summary, which is not a draft master plan at all. It's a summary of, of what was proposed during that process to, to, to air um, publicly and will absolutely will, will include um, the you know, the, the prioritization of, um, of recommendations and order. Yeah. That's it, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank, thank you for uh, letting me follow through those points. So, so I do have passion, uh, passion. one. Passion. <laughs> Take a drink. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, the city commission 
wanted to emphasize the neighborhoods in this plan because so much of our pa most recent past work, probably the last 10 or 15 or even 20 years, has concentrated on the downtown. And the neighborhoods uh, are an important and large part of Birmingham. I think you've presented some interesting ideas for the seams in the neighborhoods. But one of the things that I was particularly concerned about, and actually did mention to Sarah when we had our interview, was something that I have noticed and that has been discussed with me by many, many people who live in, Re in Birmingham, which is the character of our neighborhoods and the changes that people have seen and don't really like. So for example, a neighborhood that has traditionally had all ranch houses is now becoming a neighborhood with colonials. And a neighborhood that had uh, intimate sized homes, when those homes are demolished, are replaced by really large homes. And so I was hoping to see in the uh, master plan some attention paid to whether the city can have an influence on the way our neighborhoods are developing and give us some ideas, whether it's by ordinance or some other way, to make sure that our neighborhoods, which are so interesting, one of the things about Birmingham that is so appealing and attractive is that we have a lot of diversity in home styles, home sizes, uh, even lot sizes. And it is, I think, apparent that we're losing a lot of that difference. And I, I see nothing in the plan that's supposed to concentrate on neighborhoods that addresses this issue, which is an issue in our city. So I'm hoping that you take some time on this, on this uh, issue and include that. Uh, whether there's anything we can do about it, I don't know, but maybe you do. And if there is nothing that can be done, we need to know that too. It's a bit of a conundrum, but we can help explain why. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of what we feel we're most helpful with is uh, trying to clarify conditions, like help people understand what's going on in complex situations. And so we, we can do, do that, not to sidestep anything. Um, yeah, it sounds like you are. Because we specifically asked early on, no, I'm happy to, we're happy to make rec recommendations and you know, I'm thinking of, of ways to start to, to consider this because you know, really in here the, the sort of first step of trying to figure out what neighborhoods are is what we were getting to here so that then we could provide more um, basis for clarity in each of those. So what's the character of this neighborhood and, and that neighborhood, which, which we can get into more detail there. Um, I, I did want to, to bring up one, uh, we, we had put a couple questions on that first survey uh, that was on during the charrette. And I think at the end was about a thousand respondents. Um, and, and there it was 50-50 in terms of people thinking that the neighborhood character was, um, was decreasing because of change and people thinking that it wasn't decreasing because of change. And that leaves us in a very strange um, position. But we definitely heard one-on-one um, -on -one in the pre-interviews before, um, not just your interviews, but with, with the public, um, before the charrette uh, about these changes of character and concerns about the change of character. Um, and, and during the charrette, when we held a meeting on housing, the only thing people wanted to talk about was affordability. So that sort of put our focus on on, on that side and, and less so on character. We brought it up, but people didn't really respond at the time. So affordability actually dovetails in many respects with neighborhood character. Yeah. And when you have uh, 
a neighborhood with a small house and the lot sells for $400,000, you wind up with a gigantic house on there mm -hmm. because they demolish it and rebuild, and it makes no sense to build the identical thing on a lot that pr that's pricey. So I would, yeah, there, I would, appreciate, I would appreciate seeing something specifically yes. and not just affordability. Sure. So, um, any other comments? Do you need anything else from us? No, no. I, I could discuss this issue for, for hours, <laughs> but I don't have to, to drag you into it. So, um, <laughs> so I didn't need anything else. Really, just feedback and, and direction from you all on what we should add into all of this as we work towards the, the first draft. So it's all very helpful. Thank you. Okay. And we can speak with you privately if we have some typo type uh, issues? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Any other comments from the commission? Public. Okay, public. Clinton Ballard, <clears throat> 388 Greenwood. Um, I have a couple of questions. Greenwood? Uh, I'm sorry, 822 <laughs> Shirley. Habit. Um, I I don't know if I got it or missed it. Uh, the timeline on your final report. Uh, may I direct? May I address them directly? Or why don't you ask me? Okay, we'll What's get the, the answer. The timeline on the final report uh, is that expected? What What are we expecting? Matt. Yes, um, I was pulling up the document which I already had pulled up in case that question was asked. <laughs> And this, because it's been, um, you know, adjusting as we got into this and shut, set the timeline for the charade and so forth. Uh, so as I had mentioned, we have a plan to um, to present uh, to you all uh, September 23rd, a first draft uh, of the master plan, which, you know, gives time after the elections and so forth. Uh, and then uh, we have a plan on January 13th to present a second draft of the master plan following um, comments from, from you all and from the public on the first draft. Uh, and then we have a plan at the end of uh, January, beginning of February. Um, uh, so ideally February 5th with, uh, with planning board and uh, February 17th uh, for first hearing with you all uh, of a final master plan. So the plan is for, for two drafts uh, before a final, both to have comments from, uh, from from the commission, planning board, and the public. It, Mayor, is that a typical timeline for a project like this? Uh, one of the things uh, that you may not know is that we did, when we established the RFP to begin with, was to give a good long um, timeline so that we could get the best input from public and that I think that's why they're doing a first draft, second draft, and so on, to continue to receive input because it does last 20 years or more. It ne never really ends. But, Matt, uh, in your experience, is this a typical timeline? In my experience, it varies wildly. <laughs> um, uh, but it's usually, it's usually at least a year. Um, if, if not, it's a year to a year and a half is pretty typical. And you mentioned the election. I that came out. I was curious what. Well, just because we, we can't have a, a meeting with commission when you have you know you've got a commission meeting uh, that is uh, during um, during the commission elections, and then you have the first commission meeting after newly elected members, which is not an appropriate time to review a first draft of the plan. The the new members may may not have sufficient time to review the full draft. So that affects the timeline and pushes that, that draft off. Okay, I understand. Um, uh, Commissioner Nikita uh, brought up the Bates Street extension, and I was curious whether you had been asked uh, either to look at that or had been asked to not look at that. Uh, generally, it was discussed that it happened before the process and is in process before we began, and, and therefore not part of the specific scope for the work to be done. Um, and then it was discussed a bit during the, the shred, and I think on Andres opined a bit on that, that in, in terms of whether or not that was 
happening, it was part of the 96 downtown plan um, in practice. And so uh, we haven't uh, decided to be involved in that, um, you know, after that point. Since it's already part of a master plan that is ongoing. So was it, well, I won't pursue that line of questioning, but the thought, the question is, was it your decision not to pursue that, or did the city ask you not to pursue it? It wasn't my decision, but I gave that to, to Andres, the um, principal of my firm, to, you know, to decide what to do with that. Okay. Um, so my comment, uh, as the commissioners were uh, suggesting things that might be uh, looked at, would be that <clears throat> we have an election coming up, a special election on the Bates Street Project, and uh, there's significant opposition, and it, uh, it, it's Mr. possible Mayor, Mayor, that yes, you cannot use the podium for this sort of discussion. Well, it, it regards Sorry, you're uh, out it of regards order. the planning. Order. You're out of so order. So my suggestion would be that you look at that, or that at some point you brought be brought in to look at that as part of this uh, 2030 plan or 2040 plan, and because. Uh, we, we, the community does not want. Excuse that me, not you're to out of planned. order. Stop. Our attorney has uh, uh, directed that that is an inappropriate discussion, and you're going to Can have I ask to stop. the city attorney why that's inappropriate? Because you cannot use the cable television which the city pays for for political purposes. It's not political. Yes, it is. No, I'm suggesting that the planners help plan when the, when the community decides, if and when the community decides. The plan that you're, you're pursuing you're, right you're now. You're out of order. <laughs> order. <laughs> well, folks watching on TV may decide that I'm not out of order, and we're you're out of order right now. To a city planner, you'll have to stop. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure where the camera is up there. Up there. Where is it? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. We're moving on now to uh, resolution approving the revised 2019-2020 Planning Board Action List. Good evening. Good evening. Well, as you know, the Planning Board uh, once a year in their annual report, as part of the annual report, does an action list. In recent years, we've been updating it usually once, twice a year, particularly after joint meetings. We had a joint meeting on June 17th, and as you know, we discussed several new planning issues, or not new planning issues, but things that have come up here in Birmingham that we might want to consider adding to the list. So we have updated the list based on what you saw in March, so this is different. <coughs> Primarily updated it to take off those things that we'd already finished. We, of course, have number one, the master plan update, which as you just heard is the current discussion of the uh, year in Birmingham. And then we, we actually added two things as a result of the last joint meeting. One was a uh, solar panel review process. If you remember, we had said that currently if you were proposing to put a uh, solar panel installation of any kind on your house on the front, you would have to go through a full planning board hearing, whether or not that was necessary. And then the second item was the issue of balcony and terrace enclosures that we talked about as well, that people are now enclosing them. Are they screen rooms? Are they glass, et cetera? So those two items have been added. And um, the planning board also has just put several comments throughout the list that many of these things obviously are subsumed or part of the master plan discussion over the next year. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions or for you to let me know if you want to change this priority, if you like the way it is, et cetera. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, did the planning board <clears throat> decide the order of this list? So solar panel no, and balcony, no, no. Not I mean, since they're the, the newest meeting. things. No. no, I put those in based on, the re I put them in as a suggestion in this mm -hmm. order, only because one, obviously the master plan is the number one thing going on in town right now from planning perspective. And then a lot of the others, they, the planning board had said it's part of the master planning process. That's why these two rose to the top. 
Okay. Commissioner DeWeese? Uh, I just note that many of these are high priority, but we have recommend they be considered as part of the master plan process, things like retail and all kinds of other stuff. Just be sure you're working with that team so they're actually getting considered. Uh, and uh, because some of them aren't directly neighborhood related. And uh, there's no need to delay if, if we're not dealing with it. And we, if we're going to deal with it, it needs to be integrated so that you've got a common perspective. Uh, I'm just concerned when you put it there, it's high priority stuff that may not have an action for another year. Some cases that's fine, but some cases it may not be fine. So it's fine to have it, but be sure that you're working close so that it's actually part of the process. Commissioner Hoff. I have uh, questions on a few of these. Uh, number two is the solar uh, panel review process, which we discussed and which I think is appropriate. But also number 14 refers to uh, sustainable urbanism, and you have discussed um, uh, solar power there on number 14. And recommendations may cons be considered as part of the master plan, but... The, the panels are a little bit different, aren't they? Well, they are because we already have regulations governing them. We don't have anything, for instance, regulating geothermal issues, or we don't al we don't allow um, the non porous or the porous concrete right now. So some of these are more newer ideas that we haven't implemented okay. in any way. We're solar panels and wind. Both of those two we already have in our ordinance. So for the solar panel review process, it's my a minor tweak as opposed to adding but a whole new thought. Okay. And then number four, the definition of retail and uh, recommended to be considered as part of the master plan process. I think my comment is very similar to Commissioner DeWeese. Are they considering it? Yes, they are. In fact, they talked about it tonight in terms of the boundaries, what the primary and secondary retail uses should be in different areas of downtown. Yes. It's okay. In there. And it's in that report that you have tonight, too, if you want to flip through it. Okay. And then number 10, um, about the D5 zoning from Hazel to Brown, we had a um, request on the old Woodward uh, on a, a property on Old Woodward, and then this is recommended to be considered as part of the master plan. Is that? I mean, uh, how? Not, well, I think the whole point of in, of that being included in the master plan process is the density and the zoning along Woodward is an area that they're looking at in general not that site that you're referring to in particular right. but zoning in general along Woodward if you can have more density is that where you would want it those kind of more general questions are being included okay all right I'm fine thank you anyone else seeing none anyone from the public on the uh, planning board list of priorities see none guess it's okay do we have a motion we need a motion either accepted all right commissioner sherman i'll make a motion to uh, accept the um, planning board's um, action list with the understanding that this is kind of uh, temporary until we have the master plan when the order will may and probably will change second okay any discussion anyone from the public seeing none all those in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you jenna thank you okay our next item is uh 6d which is a recommendation by the uh cemetery board regarding the number of plots in certain sections that will be either released or not. And by the way, for the public's benefit, oh no, not on this one, it's the next Thank one. You. All right. <laughs> who's, who's, pre oh, you're presenting. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, just as a quick background, in 2015, 530 potential grave spaces were identified in sections B, C, D, K, L, and O. 
in August of 2015, the Commission released those plots for sale, but they limited the sale of newly identified graves in sections B and C to 240 and asked that the Greenwood Cemetery Advisory Board, <clears throat> also known as the GCAB, uh, review the situation when sales hit 200 and make a recommendation back to the City Commission on whether or not additional grave spaces of those original 530 should be released. <clears throat> um, at the end of first quarter of 2019, so at the end of March, a uh, number of spaces sold in B and C reached 206, and that's what has triggered the um, GCAB to discuss this and make a recommendation. They discussed this on June 7th, 2019, and make a recommendation to you that an additional 60 graves be released for sale in sections B and C. That would bring the total allowable sales of the new spaces to 300. And um, they recommend that when sales reach 270, they again review the situation and bring forth another recommendation to the commission. Okay. Any comments? Commissioner Harris? Um, I had a question about the portfolio target. I suspect it might have some relevance to the, the issue we're discussing tonight. That projection um, assumes or aspires to the sale of 622 graves. Correct. But the uh, 2015 study shows only 530 available. So how do you square those two numbers? Um, when I asked uh, the finance director to put together this analysis, is asking him to tell us what we would need to sell in order to get our portfolio to a place that would afford the annual maintenance fee. So, yes, 622 plots is an unreachable number, but based on our current um, investment allocation, that is what it would take to get our portfolio to the place where its income would pay for annual maintenance. Which is 60000 a year? Yes, correct. Okay. okay, thank you. Commissioner Hoff? Well, I noticed that the majority of spaces that have been sold, um, 480 spots are in uh, B and C, and only 50 in D, K, L, and O. Why is that? There were fewer spaces in those sections to begin with <clears throat> available for sale. Well, according to... Um, previous minutes, there were 132 spaces that have been identified other than B and C. 132. And they're not being sold. It's being focused on B and C. That's one concern that I have. Also, when we go on to the next item on the uh, agenda, we're referring to um, Section F, both North and yet, there's no reference in in this uh, the list of what was sold to Section F. There are no plots available in Section F. It's sold out. Section F is sold out. Mm -hmm. So anything new there are plots that had been purchased previously. When you say anything new, <clears throat> you mean new burials? I, get, I don't know if they're burials or there are uh, monuments that are uh, being... Uh, made for Section F. Right, they're for <clears throat> either um, previous interments where monuments are now being installed or new burials in those spaces that are sold but as yet unused. So as they begin being used, then um, some of the families are wanting monuments on those spots. Okay. So but it's sold out, but it's not... Used up. Used, used up. <laughs> Thank you. I understand. Built I understand. Out. Okay. Well, I will voice my opinion, and my opinion hasn't changed in uh, um, how many years it's been since we, we've done this, four years. I did not want to see burials in Section B and C until all other areas in the cemetery were filled, because B and C are two 
are two historic sections, and they're unique to Birmingham, and they really, in my opinion, should have been protected and not have other graves in between. But that's all over with now. They were sold, 480 of them. I would not be in favor of any more in those two sections until everything is sold in the other sections that's available. And according to what I'm reading here, there were 132 spaces. I don't know what happened to them. Only 50 were sold. So there should be 72 spaces. No, 62 spaces, spaces available. Commissioner Sherman. So just looking at this as we're now kind of winding down the number of spaces that are available in the cemetery, have we looked at our pricing? Is there becoming a diminishing? We, we have not looked at pricing in, in terms of the price of lots. Yes. No. You know, and that goes to this analysis that's been done on the number of lots needed in order to make sure that the, uh, the fund is available. Uh, it would seem to me that, that that's something that the board should do, be doing promptly to figure out whether $3,000 a lot is an appropriate rate uh, in the current market based on the number of lots that are available. That would go also for the perpetual care fund. Exactly. Which is a separate fee, and it's not a separate fee? A portion of the lot sales goes to the perpetual care fund. Well, that that is an area that definitely needs to be examined. I, I question whether the 3000 is. I mean, it, it, it's been like that for years, and it's something that needs to be looked at. Any other comments? Commissioner DeWeese? Yeah, my understanding is before we started establishing a price and doing it ourselves, many of those graves were selling much higher on the individual market. So there is some demand pricing issues here that should be considered. Uh, so I'm just reiterating uh, Commissioner Sherman's point. Uh, section B is a little more historic than C. Uh, a is very historic. Uh, so, so there may be some grounds for going on and doing something in C, but I, I confirm with uh, Commissioner Hoff that <coughs> just automatically <coughs> proceeding in B particularly may not be what we really want to do. I'd, I'd like to have more understanding of why the cemetery board is specifically recommending that other than they just see that it's available. Commissioner Harris? Um, just to try to better understand the marketplace here, I'm, I'm looking at the chart, which was part of our memo, and the lots sold within Section B since 2015. <coughs> 2015 at 33. 16 had 60, 17 had 36. And there's a precipitous decline in 18 of only 18 lots sold within Section B. I'm just curious, is that attributable to the fact that there are fewer uh, plots available within B? Or is, the, is that just... Um, is that just a random data point in, in the marketplace? Do we have any knowledge about why that occurred and if it is because of fewer uh, lots being available I'd be more inclined to support the resolution um, unfortunately <clears throat> we've got four members of the <laughs> Greenwood Cemetery Advisory Board back there um, there are actually more lots available in B than C I have not gotten any data on why the trend is what it is. In 2016 is when the, um, it, to my understanding, is when we contacted everyone on the interest list. And I think that accounts for the peak of sales in 2016. Um, and th they are definitely leveling off. Thank you. C Commissioner Hoff. 
Uh, that's what I was going to say, just what Sherilyn said. There was a list prior to this, no one could get a plot in the cemetery. It was filled up. Once we allocated uh, spaces between the graves in the historic section, um, the... Um, the cons consultant, Sloan Consulting, they started calling, and they called everyone, and that's why I think there were so many people who were on the list then. Now, it's just people who call in, whereas there, there was a list of people who wanted a plot in the cemetery, and that's what, I, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I think, why it's tapered off. It, is it worthwhile to consider... Um, Re-engaging prospective purchasers to increase sales, or is that is that not a good use of resources? Are you talking about the interest list? The interest level seems to be tapering off significantly. Well, the interest list that we're talking about is exhausted. But the, I think what the commissioner is talking about oh, is marketing. Is marketing marketing? Right. marketing. Um, Maybe that could dovetail with a consideration of increasing the price. Commissioner Sherman. Um, when we looked at this back in 2000, and I think it was, was it 15? Um, yeah. Part of the issue was we had this significant list, as Commissioner Hoff stated. And th the question at the time seemed to be what was going to be the demand after that list was taken care of. Well, we, we see it's generally 30, 40 lots a year. So we know what that is. Um, we didn't know if there was going to be a demand once that list was taken care of or, or the extent of it. So we now have a handle on that. Uh, I go back to my original comment that I think we have to look at our pricing now that we know what that demand is. Um, personally, you know, I would not be inclined to, to allow more lots until we have a determination of what um, these lots should be priced at. And then when they come, when that's brought back, then we can deal with the number of lots. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I uh, agree with Commissioner Hoff that selling additional lots in sections B and C is ill-advised. We have a really important cemetery in our city, and those two sections represent history. History is more than just who's buried there. History is also how the cemetery was arranged in those times. And the cemetery was arranged specifically with paths that allowed mourners to not only visit their loved ones, but also to enjoy nature while they were there. And I, I really want to retain that feeling in the cemetery. Additionally, the cemetery is not sold out, aside from those sections. Right here on our memo, we have 50 plots available for anyone that cares to be buried in Greenwood. We also directed the cemetery board to look into uh, means of discovering whether there are additional plots that we don't know about. Places in the cemetery where we think maybe someone is buried, but it may be a false belief. And I see no report back. Uh, one of the mechanisms that was being explored was ground penetrating radar. And I understand that there are some issues with ground penetrating radar. It may, it may tell you someone's buried somewhere when in fact it's something else. But it also tells you when nothing is there. And that alone could add additional spaces for people to be buried where we don't have to invade an historic part of the cemetery. So I am not uh, in favor of expanding the number of plots to be sold at this time, for sure. Maybe ever, I could change my mind. But uh, 
I think we have other work, the, the board has other work to do first and needs to attend to that. Commissioner Sherman. Just a, a question. Where do you see 50 plants available? Right here on our number of graves, D8, K16, L16, that and was, That was O10. in 2015. Well, so if you look at the numbers, if you go to the now. next page, those numbers, we have six in D, mm -hmm. two in L, and four in O. All right, 12, 12 spots right off the bat that that's haven't it. been sold. Right, but that, that, that's, and then we have the remaining spot. That, that's why I'm asking. I'm not trying okay. to be argumentative. Yeah, I understand. I, I, only think, but I don't think that there's that many spots, but I do agree that there's still more that has to be done. 46. Right, and the other thing is, and here's something to think about. At some point, this cemetery will be filled. So we have to decide at what point we say it's filled. Is it filled when all available plots, with the exception of B and C, are filled? We can declare that that's it. That's as many as we have, and that's all we're going to sell. Or we can decide that it's not filled until every space in the historic spot is filled. And then it's filled. So that's a decision that I think the community has to also weigh in on, but that per I have an outlook on that, and I think uh, personally that we can declare the cemetery filled without disturbing the historic areas. And that's it. It's done. So, but it will help if we know that there are spaces that are unidentified at this point that could be sold in all of these other sections. And we suspect that there are such spaces, so let's find them. And I won't even get into the delicate issue of reclamation. So, Commissioner Harris. Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. What is the status of the ground penetrating radar project? Um, the board has um, approved going forward with that, and they will be looking at a RFP at their August meeting. And we'll put that RFP out and get that project going. Okay. Commissioner Hoff? Well, I'm re-looking at this chart, and I think I was interpreting it wrong, but the chart on page two. Why does it say in section B, 152 have been sold and there are 256 remaining? What, do, what Where did that figure come from? That's a, the total that was found back in 2015. So that's not the total remaining that we are allowed to sell, that have been approved to sell. That's just the the actual total remaining in section B correct that were, was determined when it was determined to put the flat headstones between the other graves in section B and C is that correct when the <clears throat> 530 spaces were identified in 2015 okay I understand thank you and I'd also suggest in looking in 2000 uh, 15, we, it was my understanding there were 132 other spaces that were identified other than section B and C. Now we're not seeing that. We're seeing a very small number in the, of other spaces. So I would just ask that someone take a look at that and what happened to those 132. Commissioner Harris? I just what I think is the final comment. I'm inclined not to support the resolution more along the lines of Commissioner Sherman's uh, comments. It seems like the demand there, the water has found its level and it's, it's prudent to wait and determine if our sale price is reflective of the market and in the meantime you're not going to be depriving anybody of the opportunity to purchase because there's still 34 available for sale in section in section B. The issue of whether additional graves should be sold at all in B and C for historical purposes seems to me has already been decided in 2015 by the commission and opposing it for that reason seems to me to conflict with the existing policy and if 
the commission really thinks that no sales at all should be allowed, that would be a separate issue for the cemetery board to consider and bring back to us, which I don't see being before us today. So I might support the sale of additional 60 plots, but I want to know what the market price is. And in the meantime, we could also figure out whether ground penetrating radar affects the number of available plots that would that would also be relevant to me. If I can add, Jill? just going back to the, I think the initial philosophy of setting up a system here to, to manage this cemetery in perpetuity, the Perpetual Care Fund was established with the understanding that the revenues generated off of that fund would pay for the operating costs of this cemetery. I think that needs to be one of the considerations for the committee as you go forward with the analysis, not only on the cost of the plots, uh, but just in terms of gener looking at your operating um, exp expenditures on an annual basis and trying to match those with the revenues coming off the perpetual care fund because that then provides a no cost operation to the city whereby capping it now uh, without any other analysis really puts that on the burden of the taxpayer to fill that gap and that I don't think was the intent when this was set up. So I think as you look at this all together that needs to be one of the elements that's included in that uh, evaluation. May I yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Boutros. So, so what, why are we really asking to release more additional spots if we already have 32 available? Is it for financial purposes? What, what's the pur if we don't even know? Why are we asking? Again, the, what's intent, the, purpose? the intent initially was to generate enough revenue so based off the sales of the plots to provide for the ongoing operating maintenance costs of the cemetery. So there was no tax burden to the taxpayer. For maintaining the cemetery, that was the kind of the goal as it was established. Now that you see that those sales are starting to wane, those revenues aren't coming in to support the operating costs. So they've, the cemetery board has recommended the issuance of some additional or authority to issue or sell some additional plots um, to move you further toward that goal. But I think the question then comes into play as to so is the rate you're charging sufficient? based on the limited supply that you have to work with. The reason I asked that to, to uh, reinforce the issue, the, the, the clarification on it's financial, right? So back to Commissioner uh, Sherman's comment and uh, Commissioner Harris, then we really have to make sure that we're within the market value. And uh, before we, I, I, I don't want to repeat the same comments. I, I believe that we should really emphasize on finding the market value and the price first before we even discuss any additional sales. Okay, so uh, any comments from the public? Uh, George Stern, 1090 Westwood, S-T-E-R-N. I would just like to, when you think about the long-term cemetery, uh, think about cremations. The cremation is now 60% of all burials. In our cemetery, we're basically are concentrating on full-body burial. To Commissioner DeWeese's comment, what churches, which were the original burial grounds in the world, uh, before we had uh, parks such as uh, uh, cemeteries, which really didn't come about till starting in the 1830s. Uh, churches nowadays and some of the historic museums are building quite beautiful, creative walls that are about too high so that they fit in very naturally into the historic landscape, both at the church and the cemetery. And I would suggest that the commission, if it's concerned about having to close the cemetery, emphasize to the board that, and maybe even look at the master plan as to how we're taking care and planning for cremation in the future, and particularly how we're blending in uh, cremation space, uh, columbarium, uh, in with the historic nature of the cemetery. Thank you. Linda Buchanan, 1280 Suffield. Um, there's so many things, I don't know where to start. But uh, in just response to uh, what George Stern said, yes, there, 
there is a tendency now toward cremation more than full burial, but the plots can take up to three cremations. So if you still buy a plot in Greenwood, you don't have to have a full burial in it. So cost effectiveness can still be the same. I mean, you can have three cremations. Uh, basically, uh, I on the committee and, and everyone else were not really too shocked at the marked decline. Because remember, you had to have, oh, at least, it was at least 150 people on the waiting list that they were able to go through. And uh, they also spread the word to others, so they probably had at least a circle of 200 people or so to call for those initial sales. And sales were brisk, if I may use the term. All right, that went for probably six to eight months or so. Then the list gets all used up, and you just have to go on with the current sales. Uh, cemeteries and whatnot, now it's very generational, and a lot of young people and the millennials and whatnot uh, don't like the traditional way of burial. I mean, some are having their ashes, you know, dusted over Rocky Mountain. So. It, it is, as, as I said, it's a generational thing. Also, I feel the sales are sort of typical of what's going on in uh, the size of a cemetery. Uh, having six, maybe a quarter or whatnot, that's not unusual. That's not unusual. We expected it to go down like that. So that shouldn't really send off a bell of any alarm. Uh, that's just kind of typical of, of what it is. And remember, it is very generational. Maybe younger people now, maybe they will change as years go by and as you get older and you think about it, but right now, uh, traditional cemeteries like that are not real popular with younger people. So, and that's across the board. I mean, that's all cemeteries. I mean, Whitechapel is just advertising all the time, so it's it's difficult to do the traditional way. Uh, but as I said, don't be alarmed by the sales. That is typical. Uh, myself, because I am a historical preservationist, I would like to see no more sales in Section B. But I think all of us on the board felt, because Elmwood is our management company, and when it was initially put in that you had to review at 200 sales and uh, do something before you reach the number of 240, I think we felt then we had to do something and, and release. So we decided to just go with a minimum number to get to 300, thinking 300 will take quite a while for them to use up because of this uh, decline in the sales anyway. But personally, I would like not to see sales in Section B. But these kind of figures, like this extra 132 and whatnot, we don't see that. When we get our quarterly reports and we see what went in L or what went in M, you know, maybe there's two over in L and, and, and one in M or something, we don't see these other numbers. That that's it's available. So the bulk of what we've been told on the board, the bulk of the places is in B and C. Out of the 530 that was originally told to us that Elmwood was going to sell, 480 of them are in B and C. And the majority, I think there's probably only 70 or so really in C. So really your bulk is in section B. And B is far more historical than C in a border set. Now there are to be no sales in A because A really has a lot of the early pioneers. But if you think about it, Hunter's in B, Martha's in B. So I mean, B has a lot of historical uh, of our pioneers in there. So um, I, I, as I said, I didn't want you to think that it was alarmed with the sales decreasing because that is just typical. It's, it's not uh, anything to be really alarmed about. That just goes with all the cemeteries. Uh, I called up a few months ago, I called up Farmington, their, their historic cemetery, and they said that they had 300 some, I think it was. And I said, well, what happened? She said, when the 300's gone, because this is at the city clerk office, she said, when the 300's gone, the 300's gone. So they weren't going to build anything, no columbariums, they weren't going to put in any more money. They said, when the historic part is gone, it's gone. 
So that uh, that may be what we have to do too. So uh, in Northville, well, they do have two cemeteries. They just didn't have the one historic. I called up on that one too. The historic one is already filled. That one is gone. But the city does own two. So one is a little more of a modern one outside of town. The historic one is the one that's in town. That's totally filled. And that's been gone for several years. <coughs> so, but as I said, don't be really alarmed at that. I'm sitting back there and hitting it. That's to be expected. Thank you. The sale decline. Thank you. Margaret Souter, uh, 1795 Yosemite. Uh, Linda just said basically what I was going to say, but I do want to add also that I, I believe in the historic nature of the cemetery should be preserved. I was very unhappy to see B being sold. Our contractor is very energetic about finding people, but even now the sales seem to be decreasing. And so I agree that things probably will decrease, but um, yeah, we probably should look at the pricing. And, and determine if we're within other uh, cemetery pricings. I think that would be a good idea. As far as the crematoriums, uh, you have to build those, and you have to have money to do that. And I think we would be better off using the money that we have in our preservation fund to look for other cemetery plots that are not filled in the cemetery outside of B and uh, see if we can't take care of those, put those up for sale, and see if those sell. But I would definitely like to not see any more in B. We have seen some of the headstones um, after a new burial. Some of the headstones have been damaged, and, and we're not sure if that's because of just because they were already damaged and when they dug the new grave that there was, that it just, it just showed up or not. But um, I would like to see no more burials in B. Um, and uh, the crematoriums, well, you know, I think, I think that uh, you can get burials, you can get three in a, in a gravestone, or in a grave site, as she said, and I, I don't think we should do the expense to put in a crematorium. I think it would be disruptive to the look of the cemetery. Our cemetery is beautiful. It is pastoral in areas. It's it's lovely to walk through. I've said, I've said before that people walk their dogs through there. It's, it's park-like, and it is just a wonderful place for people to, to come and sit. And I don't think we should start adding little buildings to uh, disrupt the look of the cemetery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mike Schneider. Uh, my address is 251 Strathmore in Bloomfield. Um, and could you spell your last name, please? S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. -E <clears throat> um, I just wanted to add something to this discussion. I, it's an old cemetery. It's, uh, it's not a huge cemetery, but relatively small. It's beautiful. I think it's just wonderful that there are still grave sites available there a after all these years. And I hope, I'd just like to encourage you not to be in a hurry to sell them all. The fact that um, grave sites were available 100 years ago or whenever it was, and 50 years ago, and they're available now, there's an opportunity for, for multiple generations of families to be buried in the same cemetery, and I think that's really, really wonderful thing. So I just want to encourage you not to be in a hurry to sell them all. Uh, if, if you hold them and then, and then 30 years from now there are some more available and then 50 years there are some more available, that strikes me as a, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Uh, briefly, um, I wanted to take heed of the manager's comment that the pricing should reflect our goal of funding the fund in a way that it can uh, pay for annual maintenance. Um, but I also appreciate the comments from the board members tonight, which were not reflected in our memorandum. So I wonder if when the board considers sale price and, and other issues, whether it's appropriate for them to consider whether additional plots should be sold at all in Section B, because I'm hearing a sentiment that maybe they shouldn't be, which was not reflected in, the, in our material. So I think we're taking no action. Okay, let's move on now to uh, new business 
E, which is our last piece of new business, also related to the cemetery. And that is uh, a reflection of the flush markers in section F, which has been a subject before the commission before. Sherilyn, enlighten us. Okay, you're right. This, um, such, uh, this issue has been in front of this commission before. Um, prior to tw uh, early 2017, Section F North allowed only flush markers. Um, all the records we can find going back show that it was always flush markers. In December of 2016, one of our residents asked the GCAB for an exemption from the rule so that he could erect a marker, uh, an above ground monument. And the, um, the cemetery board unanimously denied that request. Mr. Robertson then appealed to the commission and after um, much discussion and I think I included the all the materials that were gathered back then as to history and whatnot. The, um, <clears throat> sorry, on March 27th, the city commission directed the cemetery board to revise the rules and allow permit upright monuments in section F North. Um, what brought this back to the table is Mr. Schneider, whose parents are buried in um, F North, noticed Mr. Robertson's monument and came before the, the commission to ask that you consider reverting back to the flat markers. Um, what I will say is that the cemetery board was unanimously opposed to above ground monuments back in 2017. They are still opposed to them. Their recommendation is that the section return to flat monuments. Um, but as a way of understanding kind of what's going on in the meantime, so above ground monuments were approved um, March 27th of 2017. So since that time, Mr. Robertson's monument has been placed. Um, a monument has been placed on the Callahan's lots, and we know of at least four other monuments that are in the process of being designed and made. Um, Elmwood, as our contractor, they maintain very good relationships with area funeral homes and with um, the better known marker companies. So they get a lot of um, preview of what's coming because the funeral directors, monument companies will call Elmwood to double check and make sure that a monument is allowed on the grave that it's been requested for. So since the rule change, Elmwood has been telling people who call that yes, they are allowed. So right now, like I said, aware of four that are in process, there may be more. Um, according to our contractor, the production <laughs> life of a monument can be six to nine months. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways the commission can go on this. But if you um, take the recommendation of the cemetery board and take Section F North back to flat markers only, you may want to give some consideration to folks who have already spent money thinking they're allowed to put markers there and maybe make it effective six to nine months from now to give folks time to put it together. That that's a suggestion. That's not from the not from the cemetery board. The cemetery board recommends that it just revert back to flat markers altogether. Any questions? Commissioner Hoff. Are the four that are in um, uh, the process of being made, are they to replace flush markers? Correct. Oh, they're to replace flush markers? Well, you know what? I shouldn't say that. Um, they could be, or they. I think one of them is a, um, a husband, I'm sorry, a father and daughter who have recently been married, and, or I'm sorry, buried. <laughs> That's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Sorry. So I don't think any marker has been placed on those. So the monument would be the initial. 
Um, the Callahan. So one is a fresh one is a fresh grave that I'm aware of. I think the Callahan replaced a flat marker. I think some of these others may be replacing, replacing. flat markers. Um, does the city uh, make any money on the sale of the uh, markers? No, they do not. Does um, the contractor? Elmwood makes money on the foundations. They put in the foundations, and that's it. Monument companies they, then put on the monuments yeah. on the foundations. But then they they also have an arrangement with mon, monument <coughs> companies. You said they're on good terms with monuments. They, they have open communications so that monument companies will call to make sure before they start making one that it's going to be allowed in the cemetery. Commissioner Harris? Uh, I have two questions. One for our city attorney. It's my assumption that those who constructed monuments within section F are grandfathered in, so to speak, if we were to switch the policy. Is that correct? I would I believe so. Okay. And then secondly, when we attempted to elicit feedback about changing the policy in 2017, I believe we had seven responses, uh, five sounds, in favor. That sounds right. Okay. And then we, we spoke about um, additional effort to elicit more responses. Was there any discussion or investigation about whether we could get more feedback about this policy? We were not successful in finding another avenue towards finding next of kin. Okay, thank you. So I, I have a question about the, this flush marker section. And if I'm not mistaken, in 2017, we were unable to determine why it was made flush to begin with. Correct. Is that still the case, that we don't know the reason why it was flush? That is correct. We have not been able to locate any records that would explain why that decision was made. Is there any other section in the cemetery that's flush? No. Flush only? This is the only one. Mr. Stern is saying no. So. The, the historic. Well, the new graves. The, the oh, sold right. since 2015. In, in the B and C, in B and C area. Right. But as far as a whole section set aside to be flush. Okay. Commissioner Hoff? Well, there was an assumption that it had something to do with the land and being near the river. That was what came up the last time. But also, we have documentation of people who requested monuments in that section who were denied. I mean, that had been the policy. Mm -hmm. Was, there was a discussion last time that the reason that this policy was put in place, and I'm looking for it right now, was to allow for ease of maintenance of that section. I know that that was, was talked discussion? about as a p possible reason, now, there but was I don't... There was something written in... Um, e easy to maintain. Yeah, there was something about that. Here it is. I think it's, it's right here. It's, uh, there was a memo from Judy Ben to Tom Marcus uh, back in 1990. Um, from the Department of Public Services, the uh, Huey Lale told the city clerk at the time that to his knowledge there's no upright markers in the F North section. This restriction was placed on F North to facilitate maintenance by the DPS. That's what it was. And that was the information we had. So but that's just a my question would be, and it's I don't see anybody from DPS here. Lauren's sitting there. Oh, Lauren. <laughs> Except for her. <laughs> Is there something about Section F in the cemetery from your past experience because the city is not uh, taking care of the maintenance now? Uh, is there something different about that area that requires different treatment of the uh, maintaining the area? Well, I've not seen the, what Commissioner Sherman just read. Um, I do recall, um, I think because of the nature of the land, the terrain there, I think it sloped down. And what Commissioner Hoff had referenced to, because of the river being on the backside, I think that was just decided at that time. Okay, um, but the flush markers. But I don't know, other than just what I've heard by hearsay. I, I understand that that's 
what was proposed in the past, but the DPS maintained the cemetery in your uh, tenure. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering from your perspective about that area, is it challenging in a way different than any other area of the cemetery to maintain it? You know, it's been a while since we have maintained it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've had anything from Elmwood with regard to that, um, this reference, with regard to the monuments. Um, I'd have to take another look at it. I can't, I say just historically that's been the practice. Um, and I know Sherilyn has dug through the records over this course or this issue and have provided that information to you. Uh, and to the board of, as well, but um, <clears throat> I can't say uh, today whether or not, um, just my memory, my memory serves me that I know that's why we did it back in the, you know, over the history. Um, but yeah, I think it was just a practice that we put into place and our staff, DPS staff has just, we just kept that up until the decision was reversed by the commission. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner DeWeese. We just spent a lot of time talking about section B and C. Uh, they have a historic nature. And many of the sections of the cemetery have their unique nature. This is a unique nature here in that it's been predominantly and will remain even if we pass this resolution, still predominantly flush markers. And most people who bought plots there were fully aware that that was a restriction and that was something they, they chose to have. Uh, I'd be in support of the resolution, uh, particularly with the time limit on it. Uh, it gives anyone, provided Elmwood gets out and notifies people that they've got to have it in by that date. Uh, and then we hope we hold it in abeyance. And what I mean by hold in abeyance is one of the steps that we've asked the cemetery board to have is to eventually create a master plan. What We're spending all this time to do a master plan for our neighborhoods in our city. We don't really have a clear master plan. So I would like to see how it fits into the whole Historically, it may be that it, that was a matter of convenience or maybe even a matter of required technology, but it's got a certain character. So I'm supportive of the resolution, uh, and I, I don't see any harm in holding it. So we're going to end up getting maybe six to eight more above-ground markers, but it'll still be predominantly flush uh, if we take follow the resolution, so I'd be supportive of the resolution. I'd like to revisit it once we finally get a master plan for the cemetery, once that master plan also addresses how many graves we have and all those other things which we don't have right now. So I think this is a prudent proposal and I will be supporting it. Any other comments from the public? Oh, I didn't see your hand. That's okay. Any public can come up, but Commissioner Sherman will talk while you're walking. So, yeah, I actually go the opposite way. I don't see a reason to make a change to the rules. When we originally looked at this, and Commissioner DeWeese actually indicated this at the time, that he didn't see any practical reason to require flat markers, that there already were um, sculptures and pots and other things right. that have been placed either directly on the markers or next to the markers, and maintenance was no longer an issue, as, as was indicated. Um, this is not a historic section. It appears the, the earliest burial was in 1969. Um, we, we are going to have a number of elevated monuments in this area. It is on a sloping section, which means that they're not going to be as uh, prominent as they would be on, in a flat area. Um, cemeteries come in all shapes and sizes, and rules change within cemeteries just like everywhere else. So I, I just don't see a reason to change. There's nothing that's been presented which would 
make me inclined to change what we did just a few years ago? And, and what happens that when the next person comes and says, you know what, I want an elevated marker. Then are we going to go through this again and, and maybe change it again in two or three years? There has to be some, uh, unless there's a significant change in circumstance, I can't see a reason to change the rule. And I don't see a significant change in circumstance. George Stern, S-T-E-R-N, 1090 Westwood. I simply had uh, two comments. One was, I have uh, been involved with cemeteries for 30 years, uh, five of them. Four of them have more uh, 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 monuments and one is flush. The, the amount of maintenance is basically the same. The problem you have with flush markers is the grass tends to grow over the top of the stone. So you still have to get out and, and make sure that you uh, weed whack around each of the, of the uh, flat markers the same way that the grass tends to grow up the monument and you've got to go around and use the weed whacker. So essentially the uh, maintenance is, is the same as far as the grounds crew are concerned. The other thing I wanted to say, you asked about then why did they f have flush markers? Where did they come from? I won't take a long time over this. Uh, as I said before, cemeteries started, came around the 1830s. They were originally, uh, when we started the big municipal cemeteries at the edges of between city and country, they were places where people took streetcars and had picnics. They were winding roads. They were... Uh, uh, basically for people who wanted to get out to the country and wanted to, uh, so that they were quite, uh, and they were beautiful. They had statues and they had these monuments. They were quite a place for city people to go. After the Second World War, uh, the first one I think was in, in Arlington outside of Chicago, uh, we had the flush, they came around with flush markers. They were quite calm. They didn't have quite the, the intriguing uh, nature of the old cemeteries, but they were quite calming. And then around the, uh, it, it, in the 1950s, uh, it was thought that they uh, were more equitable for some people who couldn't afford the very elaborate uh, monuments and the, and the statues on them and, and all the other decorations of, of the big mausoleums. And so it became and very popular, extremely so in the 60s, that we have uh, equality of burial. And that's really when this uh, uh, memorial garden is the way we refer to them, but uh, uh, the Moor Garden is, is generally uh, a, a bigger area. In any case, uh, that's really why they came about in the 60s, is the whole movement of people to have absolute equality in burial as well as in life. Thank you for that history. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'm Mike Schneider. Um, I've spoken to you before about this topic. Um, I just want to make a few other comments. My parents are buried in Greenwood Cemetery in this section called F North. And they bought their cemetery plots in the 70s, and at the time we're told the plots were in a section where all the monuments would be flush with the ground. When the city decided the north section of the cemetery would be reserved for flush markers, that wasn't just a restriction on the people purchasing grave sites, it was also a promise to them that their graves would be in a section free of above ground monuments. There are other people, besides me, who are also unhappy about this change in the flush marker rule. Sherry Arcombe, the contact person for matters regarding the cemetery, told me that two other families had complained to her about this change in the rules. Two of the respondents to your survey also um, opposed this change, even though it gave them more options uh, for the monument that they would have. Most of the grave sites in the north section and have people buried in them already, um, but their family members were not included in the survey. I understand why. You don't have contact information. But I believe that many of those family members, people buried, who already have flush markers on their graves, will be unhappy to see monuments being erected in the area of the grave sites that they visit and would have opposed them and their perspective is different from that of owners of unused grave sites. 
Some people value having their graves in an area that is free of above ground monuments. And they purchased their grave sites from the city with the assurance that that would be the case. The rule requiring flush markers was an agreement between the city and all, the all of the purchasers of the grave sites in that section. Not everyone will care about that restriction, but those who do care are entitled to have the city hold up its end of that agreement. Do the promises the city makes mean nothing? Having a large monument right by my parents' graves is an intrusion and a distraction that for me has destroyed the openness and tranquility of that area that was there before. So I request that you restore the serenity and openness of the north section of the cemetery by reinstating the rule that reserved that section to have only flush markers. And that you require the above ground monuments that have since been erected there be replaced with flush markers. I believe you owe this to the families who believe what the city told them when they purchased the grave sites, buried their family members, and trusted the city to do what it said it was going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners? We're back to 2015 decision now. It seems like, uh, may I, may I yes. first? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, May I? Yes, go ahead. I promise I won't politic. I purchased a site. I was told, uh, or two, uh, it's in the north section. I was told it would have to be flush. I wasn't happy with that, um, but that's what it is. I, I didn't really think it was appropriate when an exception was made, but it was. Um, honestly, I haven't been following the discussion real closely. My biggest question is, What's the definition of flush? Because if you look at some of those flush markers, I mean, they're really, really flush, and some of them aren't. Some are a little higher up. If, if I had to do a flush marker, I'd like something that's, you know, maybe three, four inches above the ground, not right at the ground level, because the ground level, the grass grows over it, uh, you know, it, they crack. I don't know. It might be one thing to consider. What does flush mean? And can, if you want to go back to flush, maybe you give it a few inches or something like that. I don't know. I have a partial uh, answer to that issue. It could be that some of the older flush markers have sunk into the ground. I know from sad experience that a marker cannot be placed without being set on a piece of concrete that's at least three inches. And uh, so your comment is you're definitely going to be up higher. Uh, but it is an interesting question to ponder. Uh, and I think that the probably the uh, industry has a definition for, for flush marker. Like they know what, what flush means. And I, I'm assuming it means that you can't have a, a piece of stone that's above, that's got the names on it, and so on. They're flat. So, Commissioner Hoff? Well, I think we're in a real tough spot, in my opinion. Um, I certainly sympathize with Mr. Schneider and what he said, and I think he has very valid concerns. On the other hand, we, the seven of us, made the decision to allow Mr. Robertson to put a monument there. And I can't imagine asking him to take it down. Well, I, I don't I don't think that's the right decision. No, I why think not? we Well no, we made that decision. I can understand not allowing any more in the future, that that's a possibility. Um, if I had to do it over again, I can think of a couple of other options, but it's passed. We could have offered Mr. Robertson another location, but we didn't, so that's over with. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we all have to discuss it and make a decision on how to move forward. I certainly think that very valid points were brought up, 
and we're not going to satisfy everyone no matter what decision we make. No, go ahead. Um, I want to echo Commissioner Hoff's comments and also commend Mr. Schneider. I think he's, he's honored his parents and his request and the civility that he's displayed before the city is, is admirable. Um, I do want to reference Commissioner Sherman's point, though, that our decisions have to carry weight. They're not locked in stone. We can always change policy, but absent a real compelling reason, I'm inclined to adhere to existing policy, policy that we made after proper deliberation. So um, I'm inclined to maintain the status quo. Commissioner Nikita. Uh, <clears throat> I concur with those comments and uh, would only say that it's, it's a bit of an anomaly that that, I mean, you look at all the, uh, uh, the sections and we have this one particular area that, you know, has this, this history of being determined to be different for any number of reasons many years ago. And um, I feel that we, we had a full review and made a decision. Uh, and I, I, I think concurring with, uh, also with Commissioner Hoff's, you know, this is, a, this is we're, we're not, one way or the other, there's disappointment. And, I think it just, uh, there's pros and cons to both sides, but my general gut feeling is that we made the decision with for, with with our full analysis at the time. Um, I don't see a compelling reason why it's changed, and I think that my gut feeling is that F is a bit of an anomaly anyway, and I don't know why that's justifiable in the sense that everywhere else you have the opportunity to go vertical, and that's the one area that you don't. And I don't think long term it really is something that uh, needs to be atypical. So I would concur with the idea of um, staying with the policy. Commissioner Hoff? Well, I have to disagree because I'm getting a stronger feeling that why don't we put ourselves in the place of either Mr. Schneider or all of the other people who are coming to visit their parents' graves or their graves, they're planning on that, and that's the way it's been, and that's what this city said. And I can understand how you would be upset if that's what you planned on. And right now we only have one or maybe two upright, upright monuments, and we have a chance that we can go back to what these people were sold and what they expected and how they feel. I mean, this is such an emotional thing. And we're sitting up here, we don't have anyone in that section. So I think you have to be a little empathetic to the people that do, who have people buried there, and to the people who are planning on being there. We heard from someone who bought plots there and was told he can only put flush markers. So I'm kind of leaning that way because I'm kind of thinking of how the, the people feel who bought the plots and who already have, most of them already have markers, aren't they? Mo there are mark a lot of markers there? Mm -hmm. And they're all flush. Mm -hmm. I don't hear. May I? Is it, if uh, Commissioner Hoff is I'm finished. Done. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem I, Boutros. I was ready to say something until uh, Mr. Bella came up to the Pointing, but uh, I come back now to my original comments. Um, I also sympathize with you, Mr. Schneider, and with many people like you that feel that way. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we really have no data how many people feel the same way you do. There's many other people don't mind having a monument next to them. I think given the flexibility people have monuments, uh, uh, being said earlier, this is not designated a historical. If it was, I would be very opposed uh, to make any changes. But at the time in 2015, I, I was part of that decision that we approved uh, the change to Mr. Robertson, but we, we're talking individually. It happened to be the family of Mr. Robertson, but it could be somebody else that feel the same way, opposite exactly how you feel about tranquil tranquility of the uh, loved one and of the area itself. Um, I'm not saying it is very hard 
to be in your shoes, to be in that position, if you believe when you bought it, this is going to be there forever. But there's no compelling reason. We don't know really why that area is a flush area. It's, we still can't figure that out. We based that decision in 2015 based on that. We're sitting in a very, very difficult seat where somebody's going to be unhappy. But in 2015, when we made that decision, we didn't... We, we took emotion also. We're emotional people as you are. Uh, we have loved one that buried and we understand how you're feeling. But we have, we run a business in the city. We need to understand that, you know what, when we make a decision, decision need to be respected and follow through. And this is where I stand. I believe that we should not change something that we already changed. But that's just my personal opinion. I have a question perhaps for... Uh our city attorney, but it may also be actually for the people, the two people here who who uh, have talked about the flush markers. When the uh, plot was sold, the people get a deed. Correct. Did the deed say that that particular plot was to be flush marker? I don't know. Okay, nodding, yes. So, could you come up and talk about that? If you if you actually know the answer, no. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Schneider, do do you have the deed for those plots? I don't know the answer to that question. He's not sure. All right, and and Mr. Baller, uh, do you have your deed to the plot, and did it say uh, on the deed that it was flush only? Good question, and I don't know. All right, Mr. Baller doesn't know either. So to me, that that actually may... The answer's no. We have in our packet. The, the, all right, apparently... Well, here, Com uh, Commissioner Sherman. So, so here we have uh, in our packet is the... Um, Effectively, the deed, the bearer rights certificate. Um, this happens to be the one for, um, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, for Paul and Jan Robertson. Paid by the purchaser, receipt of what is, is acknowledged, is bargained and sold, and by those present does grant and convey unto the purchaser and his heirs and assigns forever all burial rights on the listed sites of Green Greenwood Cemetery in said city, according to the plat thereof, on file in the office of the city clerk yeah. and in the office of the superintendent of said cemetery, to have and to hold said burial rights to the purchaser as heirs and assigns to the sole and only proper use benefit and behoof of said purchaser is heirs and assigns forever, saying to be used for burial purposes only and subject to such ordinances, rules, and regulations as are now or may be hereafter mm -hmm. lawfully in force. So it indicates that those rules could change. Okay. Well, uh, I do think that that's an important mm -hmm. element. Uh, a comment by the seller of a piece of property is not the same as a contract. Um, and I see that you want to say something. Go, Please go ahead. Margaret Souter again, 1795 Yosemite. I believe that there was a letter attached that indicated that they were not, that they were to be flush markers. I don't believe it was on the deed itself. And, and you're, you're correct. There was a letter, yes. and that letter just says, please keep in mind, Section FN only allows flush markers. Yes. Please retain this deed in your files. The deed is what's going to control, not the letter. Uh, thank you, Ms. Souter. So this is really hard. And it's hard because, you know, this is just not any old piece of property. This is a place where someone that you love is buried or where you expect to be buried. And um, I understand the argument to keep a commission decision intact. Um, as to the feeling uh, by Mr. Schneider that he wants to restore the serenity of the area, 
I don't think that's possible at this point because we can't require someone to remove a marker. And we also have additional markers, one that's been installed I, apparently by the Callahan family, okay. and apparently four more markers that have already been approved and are <laughs> underway to be uh, processed and, and placed, and we can't Uh, change the rules so that the family incurs an expense that just wouldn't be right mm -hmm. so we're in this dilemma of emotion versus uh, rulemaking and additionally we have a deed that clearly allows for change of rules so I'm looking for a, a, a decision or a motion so we can make a decision. Commissioner Harris. Um, I'll introduce the second proposed resolution, which is to maintain the current Greenwood Cemetery operational procedures, conditions, and regulations, allowing above ground monuments in Section F North. I second that. Okay. Boutros. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Hoff. I'm not going to support this because I think we made a mistake. That's what I think. I think we made a mistake in grant. I think there were options that we just didn't think of. There were options for Mr. Robertson. Um, and as far as the other four, we really don't know what stage those are in. If they've been manufactured, if people have given money, if we don't know that. We, we understand that four are in the process, but we don't know what stage they're in. So my feeling is to leave what's there and continue as has been since this since that was declared since the uh, cemetery was founded that that area should be flush but leave what's there because I don't think that it's appropriate to ask them to move it <coughs> but to move forward with the flush monuments as promised to these people any other comments Comments on the motion from the public? Seeing none, I'm hesitating because I can't decide. <laughs> I am going to support this motion because the appearance of that area has already been changed and we can't go back. That is, that is why. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Do we send off? Thank you for taking your time so many times, Mr. Schneider. Uh, we are sympathetic, but didn't go your way. I appreciate your consideration. All right, thank you again. Moving on now to, uh, we have already removed from the consent agenda, uh, addressed the items that were removed from the consent agenda. We have no communications that I'm aware of. It is open to the public for matters not on the agenda. Anyone? Seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I must need uh, improvement on my glasses. I haven't seen hands, I haven't seen people. Go ahead. Hi, David Bloom, 1591 Stanley. Um, when I'm done speaking, and I will do my very best to be brief, I have um, eight packets here to hand out to all of the commissioners and one for the clerk containing information that I obtained from the city website. Um, and it shows all of the calculations that I have done to make my personal assessment that this new deck on New Old Woodward. All right, you have to stop. And let me explain, David. The city of Burton, Clinton, thank you for your quick text, email, whatever it was. But the city of Birmingham has a contract with Birmingham Area Cable Board with okay. local community television, which prohibits political speech at this time. So, so what, what, what I will say, what, what, I will, what I will say then is that last week at a city commission meeting, 
there was a presentation made by Joe Valentine, myths versus facts, about things that... Mr. Mr. Bo, we're allowed to educate, not advocate. You're advocating. So everything yes, you we have to do stop. here is political. This is our city's no, city this attorneys. Is a freedom of speech issue. This is You're a First Amendment issue. My first call in the morning is going to be to the ACLU. You are violating our First Amendment rights. I don't care about a contract between the city and the cable board. This is a First Amendment issue. Every, every, you talk about the cemetery, you talk about all these issues, there's two sides, there's five sides, whatever. It's all politics. You can't cut off speech. They just did, and we will, I, I will talk to attorney and counsel about what rights I have for, viol, for possibly violating my rights. Thank you. Okay. Reports. Commissioner Wait, reports. Yeah, there are three this or four lady. other people who want to speak tonight. Lady. And I'd like to ask a question and make sure that the decision you made on the cemetery issue is communicated to those of us who have purchased plots there and to others who are considering it. If that's not political speech, I hope you'll answer that question. To answer your question, you want to notify the owners of plots in section F North that the policy that was previously adopted has not changed? Whatever. There's a lot of confusion right now. Anybody watching this meeting is going to be confused about what you just did. So, yes, I do believe that you should notify owners of the plots what they can do and what they can't do. Okay? All right. Now, I'd like to make a, a public comment on a matter not on the agenda. You have published a six-page factual Okay. Item. This is not political. I want to know who produced that. I'd like to know who produced it. Is that political to ask who who wrote it, who edited it, and who laid it out? Mr. Battle, the city of Birmingham has in past issues produced factual pieces both with the renovation of this building, the creation of DPS, the bond issue for the parks, and now this particular issue. Okay, so it, it, it has been it has been run by bond council as well, and it's permissible factual issue because it's not advocated. I'm not questioning position. whether it's factual or not. I just want to know who produced it. it was produced by the city of Birmingham. The city of Birmingham, an employee of the city of Birmingham, laid it out, wrote it. Yes. Okay, that was my first question. My, I do have a comment. You have characterized legitimate opinions of people, of residents, as myth. I don't care. You know what? You're not going to kick me out right now. You have, you have characterized legitimate opinions of residents. For example, the very first myth that you quote, if you want to cut off the TV, All right, go this ahead. meeting is adjourned. <laughs> great. It's going to look great.